Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 143. That's Pep or Planet Extra podcast. It's an offshoot of Planet America on ABC Australia, which you can see on Fridays at 8 p.m. on the ABC News Channel and a Wednesdays at something like 9.53 p.m. or something at the moment because it's an incredibly long show at 9 o'clock, normally 9.30, <laughs> but not for the next five weeks. And it's also on iView on Facebook and at ABC Planet America. That's the Facebook address. And on YouTube at the ABC In-Depth channel. On Pep, we cover all the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. We're recording this on a Thursday, so don't hold us responsible for not covering anything that happened on Thursday night or, in fact, Wednesday night because I'm 24 hours behind. So, Dave, you're carrying us for yesterday. Okay. If you're listening, you can also see this podcast on Facebook and YouTube, and that is where you'll see the the voice you just heard, Dr. Pepper himself, Dr. Dave Smith. Hello, Dave. Good afternoon. Tell me there's a disclaimer, Dave. I am Dr. David Smith. I'm an associate professor at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney, but I don't speak for either of those institutions, at least not when I'm doing PEP. So don't worry that I'm some kind of mouthpiece <laughs> for some faceless organisation that you don't trust. No, I, I don't speak for anybody uh, except for myself. You are a model to us all, Dave. And uh, thanks to Fat City Architect, who from the comments, uh, YouTube comments, who notes that this week, Pep turns four. Really? Yeah, Pep is ready for wow. prep school. Yes. No wonder we throw such fearsome tantrums on this podcast. So I can't quite remember, did... We begin this just before the pandemic hit. Do we know that the pandemic was happening when we started this? We Well, the pandemic existed at th this yeah, point yeah, in time, yeah. but it didn't exist in America. Right, yeah. okay. It was just a Chinese I, I do remember we went into mm. remote mode pretty quickly. We did. Yeah. We did, yeah. There's something else you might or might not remember. Fat yes. City uh, reminds us mm. that in episode one, which Fat City just listened to, Yeah. You said Joe Biden had no chance of ever being president. <laughs> <laughs> that city is too polite to say how I responded. I'm sure I would have agreed with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, well, that, uh, yeah. Fat City learned a very valuable lesson then, <laughs> which is we are always wrong. <laughs> Anyway. Don't put money on anything that we say. I know one thing you're not going to be wrong about, Dave. What are you grateful for? I am grateful for the Bialkanor Cosmodrome in <laughs> Kazakhstan. This is and lazy the stuff. for this is, <laughs> as we speak, I'm actually watching uh, the launch of a vehicle that's heading for the International Space Station. Uh, it's going to launch in about 17 and a half minutes of of course, that's in the time that we're recording this now, <laughs> not in the time that you're listening to it. And, I mean, have a look at this. Like, we've got the symbol of the Russian Space Authority on one yep. side. We've got the symbol of NASA on the other it's side. Beautiful. This is actually... It's a metaphor for our world. Well, it's, a, it's actually a relic of, like, Cold War era cooperation mm. between the two. Uh, w which was what was required for the International Space Station. And it is, yeah, it's kind of heartwarming that uh, in the name of science, this kind of cooperation is still going on today uh, despite everything that is happening. In 10 years' time when we're recording a pep in an ABC studio and there is a random monitor with a spaceship being launched mm. and you use that as you're grateful because you're too lazy to come up with one. <laughs> Otherwise, those two logos will be different. They're not going to be NASA and, and the Russian one. They'll be NASA and the X logo. <laughs> Just imagine that. What I'm actually worried about is that in four years' time, Fat City Architects going to say, hey, remember when you said you were really grateful for that launch to the International <laughs> Space Station? Remember that one that brought back the virus that killed 90% of the human race? If that happens, Fat City Architect, please yes, don't remind us. Yeah. What I'm grateful for, it's pretty easy for me this week. You might be able to guess it. It's the return of Jon Stewart. As a political <laughs> comedy writer, Jon Stewart is very much the man for me. The thing I like about him, yeah. uh, by the way, I'm going to put the clip in, if you haven't already watched it, the YouTube version of it, not the Twitter one, because the Twitter one went for seven minutes. The, mm. the whole full 20-minute monologue is on YouTube. I'll put it in the blurb, if you, uh, whether it's on the podcast or, or whether it's on the video, uh, video feeds of this podcast, you'll find it in the blurb there. Please watch it. It's great. Um, the thing I like about Jon Stewart mm. is that, and this hasn't changed. It's In fact, it's become more so as he's aged. Yeah. He's not just funny, and he definitely is funny. He's yeah. not just funny. He's smart. 
Right. He's smart enough to actually make a bunch of intelligent points in a monologue. And yeah. no one else does that. Mm. Like, and like there, I think there are people out there that are funnier than him. Mm. But there aren't as many. There's no one who sandwiches as many points, real points. Right. Amongst the laughs. Like yeah. he's essentially America's funniest opinion columnist. Because he makes real points. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, not not to like rain on the parade here, but how much of that is his writing stuff? Well, the fact that I mean, I've seen enough of him off the cuff, okay, and enough of him making speeches where it's just him. It's not the Daily Show, okay, to know that he is a very good writer. Sure, sure. So the so I mean, I'm not saying that he's writing by himself. Yes, but what I am saying is the point I just made about right, points. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's not his writing stuff. Okay. That's his judgment because like, yeah. you know what his judgment is. It's pretty clear. Yes. It pisses yes. off a lot of people, yes. his judgment. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, and uh, I think it's, yeah. And Anyway, so I, I, most most good comedy writers will yeah. end on a button. Right. That's what we call it, you know, a little punchline. He doesn't end on a button. He ends on a conclusion. Yes, yeah. And that's hard to do. Mm. Like uh, 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 the And the conclusions are intelligent yeah. and they're not predictable. Mm. And it... People some, sometimes accuse him of both siderism. Mm. I think they're just accusing him of that because he's not a predictable hack. Like he surprises you, mm. and the uh, and uh, I yeah. Anyway, but, but look, some a lot of people disagree with me. Look, on this, my favorite, I really my favorite moment of his was when he wrecked Crossfire. Oh, look, that is a golden moment. That, that was fantastic. <laughs> so, for those of you who are not aware, in mm. the sort of previous incarnation of Tucker Carlson, when he was a bow tie wearing. George Bush defender. He used to have this awful, unwatchable show on CNN with Paul Begala mm. called Crossfire. Now, mm. long-term peppers, people who've been listening for to our wrong predictions for four years, <laughs> yes. will have heard me talk before about mm. how in the first week when I was in the US in 2004, I turned on uh, CNN in the mot- in my long-stay motel room and um, this god-awful show was on. Uh, both George W. Bush and John Kerry had been campaigning in Pennsylvania that week and Tucker Carlson and Paul Begala were having an argument about the fact that John Kerry had had the temerity to order a Philly cheese steak with Swiss cheese, like, oh, the elitism, whereas George W. Bush had simply lied about having eaten one, yes. which I mean, actually kind of summarises the problems that both candidates had pretty well. Mm. But, yeah, they get into this, like, long and very sincere mm. argument about uh, what's worse. Like, that was mm. the standard of political discourse on Crossfire, yes. and John Stewart rightly said that this was not good for America. Uh, and that was, that was the end of that stupid show. I'll put the link... In yes. the blurb, so you can have a look at that as well. I mean, the irony of this is that twenty years later, yeah, we probably look back on Crossfire as the golden years when people <laughs> actually debated things. Like, there's just no debate. No, on, if that's, on if that's debate, that's actually everything that's wrong with debating. <laughs> yeah, sure. I would prefer no debate than that <laughs> shit. Well, you, you, you got your way. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. Look, I agree. There's, there's better debate than Crossfire, but yeah. just, uh, mm. it is funny how it turned out though. Um, I, I should say, by the way, from a selfish point of view, I'm grateful that John Stewart returned, but I actually don't think he should have come back. Right. I think I think he's risking his legacy in a big way. I think comedy's moved on a bit since him. Mm. I think politics has moved on since then. I think it, the audience, his audience has moved on a lot since then. Yeah. They expect a lot more didacticism. They expect a, a very different vibe to what he delivers. Right. And uh, they, 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 Clapter has been invented since John Stewart left. Yeah, the uh, uh, okay. the uh, which is that uh, which is when when people when people clap instead of laughing about at a joke. Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah, yes. woo, woo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that that didn't exist in twenty fourteen. Uh, okay, right. Yeah. Now it's it's preeminent, right? And I and I think that there's a very good chance that many people are going to hate John Stewart by the end of this year. But from my personal point of view. I'm grateful he returned Okay, because I love his work. And Good I'm luck, John. I'm grateful that I don't watch TV. <laughs> On last week's Grateful, I I talked about Nat Bullard's climate change graphs and I predicted that a lot of people are going to start using them. Yeah. They've started using ah. them. Now, there were like 200 graphs there. I expect no one went through all of them because yep. that's just a bit much. Except but if you. Uh, of course I did. Yes. But, but for those who are interested yep. in climate change at all, mm-hmm. I'll put a link. In the blurb as well, there'll be a lot of links today. I'll put okay. a link in the blurb to 
Your mate, and this is not me being, uh, this is not me being colloquial. Actually, Dave's mate, Noah Smith. Yeah, yes, <laughs> did did an article with a bunch of Nat Bullard graphs, and it's great. a great article. So Thanks, I Noah. recommend you have a look at it. Look in the blurb. This will help you take on some information in a way that's digestible. Mm. So do that. Uh, I'll tweet that also on the account uh, at Pep Chaz Doctor Dave. That's A P E P at P E P C H A S D R D A V E, which is our Twitter account. I, I've only been using it to post videos, but I think I'll start putting links up on there. As okay, well. just uh, like stuff on our show. You know? Yes. Anyway, as is my want, I want to get dive straight into the biggest topic of the week. Okay. And then we will get to smaller topics. Okay. The biggest topic, without a doubt, is the Biden special counsel report. Because yes, this moves is. on to everything else. Yes. Dave, just take a chair. I'll start going through this report and then and then we can take it from there. Okay. Jump jump in anytime you want, yes. obviously. Yeah, but of course. This is a 345-page report. You know I will have read it. Mm-hmm. I did. And I want to tell you about it because I really, really think it's been misreported. Mm. I mentioned some of the misreporting on – Planet America yesterday. Yep. I'm going to go into so much more detail. Okay. Because it was a mess. First of all, what did the report find? That's pretty important. Mm. Okay. There's been a lot of pre spin about this. Yep. Uh, I saw reports that Biden had about 20 documents mm-hmm. when, when, when the first raid first happened. I saw, yep. I also saw reports that he only had six. Yep. It's classified documents, yes, that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Well, by my count, going through that report, I count 85 documents mm. with classification markings on them, okay? Yeah. So it's actually a bigger deal than we were led to believe yes. until that report came out. That's the first thing. Mm. Um, secondly, Joe Biden himself l- is just blatantly lying about what the report said. He, in his press conference, just unless he has no idea, which is, yeah. Given the report, it it may be the case. (laughs) Um, He denied any of the material found at his Delaware residence. His current Delaware residence was highly classified, or Mm. he called it high classified. Mm. The report clearly indicates there were documents marked top secret slash sensitive compartmented information level. That is the highest classification level. They're in a box in his garage next to dog food. And uh, Biden also said... All the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. No, once again, dog food. (laughs) They were in a box in his garage at the cane box. that's his filing system. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. Biden also denied ever having shared classified material with his ghostwriter, Mark Zwanitzer, who we're going to hear a lot about. Can I just say uh, Mm. that storing the thing next to dog food Mm. This is as tantalisingly close as we're ever going to get to a real-life case of the dog eating something <laughs> as an excuse. It's true. It was, the dog was eating the food, not the, not the documents. <sighs> so close. <laughs> um, yeah, so Biden denied ever having shared classified information with his ghostwriter, Mark Zwanitzer. The report not only details that he shared classified information, they have a, an audio recording of him sharing classified information with his ghostwriter. He definitely did. They can't prove willful intent, mm. but they there's no doubt he shared classified in, information. Yeah. They're saying they can't prove it was intentional. Okay. That's all. Okay. So, so there's that as yeah. well. Third, the media was absolutely pathetic in the way they reported this. Pathetic. This is, is going to be one of my tantrums, my four-year-old tantrums. Uh, many people reported... That, yes. that her wrote, quote, President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials. In fact, everyone reported that. What they didn't report is that before that were the words, our investigation uncovered evidence nah. that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials. That's really important. It's very important. Because, yeah, the Steele dossier was evidence yes. that Trump got pissed on in a Moscow hotel. That's right. It just wasn't very good evidence. Yes, yeah. Right? So the question is not whether they uncovered some evidence. Mm. The question is did they did, did, did they uncover a prosecutable amount of evidence yes. or sufficient evidence or a lot of evidence? Yes. And the answer, as it turns out, is no. So that's a really, really big difference. Yes. Uh, another thing is if the media bothered to read onto the eighth line rather than just the third line of the report, they would have seen that the, that he then went on to say, we conclude that the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm. So in the eighth line they're saying yeah, yeah, yeah. that they didn't have enough evidence. And the fact that wasn't reported, The reason that's so pathetic is because now you've got a thousand people saying, oh, he only wasn't 
prosecuted because he's senile. To be fair, the media had a lot of other stuff going on <laughs> at that time. This yes. is the same week that Barnaby Joyce was found horizontal in Canberra. Yeah, that's true. What, well, are you going to neglect that story? Yeah, look, it's fair. I, I did enjoy the Washington Post coverage of that. I have to say, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Their priorities were sound. Yes. Um, okay, go but on. Yeah, but yeah, so, uh, but the important thing is, yeah, that, that, that people have a complete misapprehension that he wasn't prosecuted because mm. he was senile. We're going to get to that. Okay. But the, but the, well, I promise you, I promise you we'll get to that. But he, no, he wasn't prosecuted because there wasn't enough evidence. Mm, yeah. So, so, yeah. So that's a really important point mm. to make. Uh, okay. So let's go through bit by bit every single bit of document and mm-hmm. let's see what we got. First of all, there was the documents in the Biden Penn Center. There were classified documents found there about the Iran nuclear deal. Very mm. classified documents. Page 168. I'm going to give you references here. Page 168 says, The evidence does not suggest that Mr. Biden willfully retained these documents. Rather, they appear to have been included in his large collection of Senate papers by mistake. Mm. So her found that some staff has put them there by mistake. Yeah. Now, you want to go with Biden, Penn Center? What's that? Yeah, every time Trump talks about this and he goes, he hit them in Chinatown. Mm. Yeah, every time he does that, he's talking about the Biden, Penn Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Biden had nothing to do with that. Mm. Every single time Trump says that, that's bullshit. Yeah. Okay? Next one. See, I'm going through this fast. Mm. Uni of Delaware was the next batch of documents. There were classified documents found at the University of Delaware. Biden was storing his records there from his time in the US Senate. When mm-hmm. they're talking about, the documents from 50 years ago, they're talking mm. about these documents. They're related to Europe and his time on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, Biden got Senate staffers to vet the information before it was sent to yep. the University of Delaware for, yep. for a start. That's important. On page 324, her notes that while some of the documents are marked confidential, mm-hmm. the term confidential is also used in other contexts. Right. And 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 not involving classified information. Mm. So Senate staffers could have understood these to be internal committee documents or simply sensitive documents created by authors who want to limit the number of people who viewed them. Mm. That's a quote, by the way, from page 324. Yes. Uh, the, uh, and so, and Biden at another time said he believed the same thing. The confidential doesn't always mean classified. Yeah. As it turns out, he had plenty of documents that were higher than confidentially marked. So right. that doesn't exonerate him. Okay. But in the University of Delaware, there were a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. All right. The main thing though is the classified documents found in those papers had had either already been donated by Biden mm-hmm. or he planned to donate them. None of them were particularly sensitive. On page 325, her says, it is likely that the few classified documents found in Mr. Biden's Senate papers were there by mistake. The documents found at the University of Delaware are not a basis for criminal charges. Once again, they're by mistake. Mm. Okay. Next, there are a bunch of general memos that turned up in various parts of Biden's property, right? Mm-hmm. Her went through a bunch of them. He found he found that uh, they are either they either could have been there by mistake or they or they just couldn't prove that Biden even knew they were there yeah, or yeah. willfully retained them. So he just dismissed all of them. Mm-hmm. Okay, everything so far, her just said no. Nah, there's yeah. nothing here at all. Yeah. Right. Now we get to the stuff where he was considering charges, mm. the notebooks. Joe Biden had notebooks containing his handwritten entries about issues of national security and foreign policy implicating sensitive intelligence sources and methods. That's a quote from the report. Uh, they were found in his garage, in his offices, in his basement den of his current home, mm-hmm. his Delaware home. So uh, now, now there were no documents in those notebooks. Yep. But there was class- and there were no classification markings. Right, yes, yeah. But there was classified information right. written there, handwritten oh, okay. by him. Yeah, yep. All right. And he should have known that as well because mm. for eight years he wrote in those notebooks about classified information during classified meetings. Yep. All right, that he attended in the White House Situation Room and yep. so on, okay? So he knew he had the notebooks. He knew the information was in the notebooks. Okay, so – but the question is, there's no doubt he knew he had them. Mm. The question is, could her prove willful intent that he was keeping notebooks that he knew – he wasn't entitled to keep. Ah, That's right. the issue. Okay, okay yes. the last bit. The yep. no, he wasn't entitled to keep them. The reason why that's a tough that's tough to make a case out of mm-hmm. is because uh, the. I mean, well, I was, before I tell you that, there's a few other elements of this. 
<laughs> Biden kept those notebook, notebooks when he was a vice president in a classified safe. Right. So he knew that there was classified information there. Otherwise, yeah. that's why he was keeping them in a classified safe. Okay. Mm. Um, and he, he obviously knew the meetings were classified. But her calls them notebooks. Yeah. Biden, when he refers to them, calls them diaries. And that's an important distinction because the Presidential Records Act explicitly excludes diaries, journals, or other personal notes from needing to be handed in. Right. And there is precedent of mm-hmm. the Presidential Records Act being used to exclude diaries. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, Ronald Reagan had diaries with classified information in them, and when they found them, they didn't charge him for keeping the diaries, even mm. after those diaries became key evidence in the Iran-Contra investigation. Okay. Uh, in f- so they let him keep the diaries and he got away with that. Then that was the precedent set. And Biden knew that. Mm. He cited it to her in his interviews. Right. Uh, quote from page 248. During our interview of him, Biden was in- emphatic, declaring that his notebooks are my property and that every president before me has done the exact same thing, that he has kept handwritten classified materials after leaving office. He also cited the diaries that President Reagan kept in his private home after leaving office, noting that it included classified information. So that came from Biden directly. Mm. By the way, that doesn't sound very senile to me, but anyway. No. Um, the, uh, now, reading between the lines of the report, yep. I'm pretty sure her didn't buy it. Right. And that's why he kept on calling them notebooks. And I'm pretty sure that her thought that that Biden should have, shouldn't have held on to them. Yeah. But if Biden thought it was legit yeah. to hold on to them, yeah, yeah, then yeah, you yeah. can't prove he knew mm. he wasn't entitled to keep them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so her just accepted it. Yeah. And just said, I just can't prove this. And so, quote from page eight Mr. Biden was mistaken in his legal judgment. Oh, sorry, that Mr. Biden was mistaken in his legal judgment is not enough to prove he acted willfully, mm. which requires intent to, to do something the law forbids. Yeah. So that was the end of that. that, that, that yeah, 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 yeah. And, I mean, it's hard to argue against that because it is true. Like so many politicians keep diaries mm. that, and then publish them. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, mm. obviously the issue of having classified information in there complicates it significantly. Mm. But, um, uh, yeah, no, I can see th- that would have been an impossibly long bow to draw. Yeah. So, yeah. so far, plain sailing. We haven't, okay. we haven't got to the tough bit yet. Okay. Okay, the next bit. which we, we, By we, the way, speaking of haven't got uh, to the tough bit yet, <laughs> yeah. it's launched. Yeah. Look, the, the yeah. things are falling away they're from the, it. Yeah, yeah little, back, back little, to Earth. Bye. Mini rockets are going. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it, it, I don't think it's clear of the, uh, the Earth's gravity yet. No. no but no. Uh, that, anyway, okay. back, back well, to, that, yes. That's very exciting. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's just keep on going with this, yep. this special counsel report. Okay. Okay, the next step, we we're moving up the hill now to the biographer. Yep. I just I said we'd come back there, him. Mm-hmm. Biden is on tape reading about classified information from his notebooks to his biographer Zwanitzer, yep. who has no uh, class, has no clearance, no authorization. No authorization. Yep. Okay, so that's the next next, next <laughs> issue. Let alone the fact that the entire reading public of Joe Biden's biography is not going to have authorization. Well, that's true. Although Biden, I mean, I'm jumping ahead. A little admittedly, bit. that was you know how many people bought and read Joe Biden. The, the, was it was it please dad or something? Please yes, yeah, 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 yeah please yeah. father. Go on, peppers, yeah. hands up. Who read it? <laughs> Not me. I don't see anyone. <laughs> anyway, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that book. Yes. Um, now, obviously, once again, same standard. Did Biden know the information he was reading to his one that was classified? Mm. Now, he seemed to be cognizant of potential classification issues. Yep. We know this from the recordings mm. where he at times said that a number of the bits he was reading out might be classified and that they would need to be checked. Yeah. Right. So he didn't say this is classified. He said, but you know, things in this book might be classified. Right. So he was aware of the possibility. Yes. All right. On page 245, they talk about how in October 2016, Biden skipped over a whole section of his notebooks entirely that was classified. And it seemed like he was skipping over them on purpose because they were classified. Mm. But here's where it gets a little bit dodgy. Mm. In February 2017, a few months later. Yep. Biden said to Zwanitzer that the notebook entry related to that the one I'm talking about yep. related to a long meeting on the Security Council. It probably was classified. And then he read aloud to Zwanitzer portions of the notebook entry that contained classified information mm. from that meeting. So 
straight after saying this this meeting probably was classified, yeah, yeah. he read out mo- moments from it. <laughs> then April 10, 2017, Biden turned to the same notebook entry and read more classified portions allowed from the same meeting. Okay, so that's where we're getting into slightly dodgy area, yes. right? About being able to prove it. Mm. But her cleared him of that mm. because on page 245, he said during the February 2017 conversation, Biden appeared to say that the meeting his notes summarized, not the notes themselves, probably was classified. Ah, uh, okay, yep. Though it, it was foreseeable that Mr. Biden's notes about classified meaning would themselves be classified, yeah. with, which they were. <laughs> the evidence does not prove definitively right. that Mr. Biden actually knew that yes. or that he intended to share classified information. Yes, you could definitely make an argument mm. that he should have known yes. that, and given her, how and, long he had been around classified information for. And does her make that argument? Oh, yes, yes, he makes it. but. but- but yeah. the, the guy's going by the book. Yeah, yeah, Like, he he's going by the book and he's just saying, no, we need to sh- prove beyond a reasonable doubt here. And so it's really obvious from this that he's thinking Biden knows this. Yes, yeah, yeah. But he's saying, I just can't prove it. Uh, then by he talks about Biden defense from page 224. He says that Biden explained also in his interview that when he described material in his notebooks as classified, he didn't actually mean classified. He said, I might have used the word classified with Mr. Zwanitzer in a generic sense to refer not to the formal classification of national security information, but to sensitive or private topics to ensure that Mr. Zwanitzer would not write about them. He also said he wasn't sure if that's what he was thinking because he didn't remember the conversations. Right. That's what he was saying. Yeah. Now, her says that that defense is patently bullshit. <laughs> her says this, expl- this explanation that because a quote that classified the classified doesn't mean classified is not credible. Biden, Mr. Biden, had nearly fifty years of experience dealing with classified information. There you go. There you go. Yes, it is not plausible that a person of his knowledge and experience used the term classified in this context as a euphemism for private. <laughs> so, and I agree with him. He like it's bullshit. <laughs> nice try, Biden. But even then. Her said that wasn't enough. Wow. Okay. His conclusion to this section, he was good, her. Yeah, no, yeah. Me. His conclusion to this section, page nine to 10, says mm. Mr. Biden should have known that by reading his unfiltered notes about classified meetings in the Situation Room, he risks sharing classified information with his ghostwriter. But the evidence does not show that when Mr. Biden shared the specific passages with his ghostwriter, Mr. Biden knew the specific passages were classified and intended to share classified information. Yeah. There you go. Once again, off. Yeah. So now we get to the big deal. Okay. There's one more bit of documents. It's the one that I've already referred to, the box in Virginia. Mm. This is the box that they found in the garage next to the next to the Corvette, the dog food, all the stuffings. Yeah. (laughs) That box there. This is the main game. Okay. Okay. Uh, Because in this box they found two folders. Oh, there was a lot of stuff they found, but yep. amongst them were two folders with marked classified documents about military and foreign policy in Afghanistan that had the highest classification marking on them. Mm. Top secret, sensitive, compart- com- compartmented information level. That's as high as it gets. But here's something you need to understand. They found them in his Delaware house that he currently lives in. Mm. He can have them there because yeah, yeah. he's president. Oh, he got those documents in 2009. He could have them then. He was vice president. Mm, okay. They need to pin him with those documents between 2017 and 2020 for him to be guilty of mishandling classified documents because he had the right to possess those classified documents when he was vice president or president. Do you see what I mean? I do see what you mean, but... Uh, okay. I mean... I would have thought an ordinary person looking at that would have said, well, surely he had them in the period between when he was vice president and when he was president. Like well, he didn't he you, didn't lose custody of well, them. Well the thing during is the thing is he didn't have all his documents in his current Delaware house. Ah, I see, right. Until quite recently. Okay. He lived in a different house in uh, Virginia. But he was still living in it. 
Yeah, he was living in the house, but do, yeah. but do we know that that box was in the Virginia house? Oh, I see, right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. For all we know, that box could have been somewhere else. Yeah. And then they moved it into his current digs when he became president. Right, okay. They yep. need to prove that that box, in particular those folders, yes. were in the Virginia house with Biden when he lived there between 2017 and 2020. Okay. That's what they need to prove. Right. right? And that's the tough bit because that's history, right? Yes. <laughs> and so um, – and as it turns out, though, there was one major piece of evidence that potentially places the box in Joe Biden's Virginia house in 2017. What's that? It's that recording I described. Right. The recording of him talking to his biographer. Ah, uh, okay. He spoke to him in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 mm. and so forth. Now, Biden had a conversation with his ghostwriter on tape in 2017, and he said this. So this is a quote. So this was, I, early on in 09, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs. I wrote the president a handwritten 40-page memorandum arguing against deploying additional troops to Iraq. I mean, to Afghanistan, on the grounds that it wouldn't matter, that the day we left would be like the day before we arrived. And I made the same argument. I wrote that piece 11 or 12 years ago, he said in his quote. Mm -hmm. Now, her is fixated with the phrase, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs. He said that in 2017. He goes, now what's this classified stuff that he found downstairs? Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, he assumed that Biden was talking about the box. Mm. Now, he considered other, uh, other possibilities, okay, but yep. basically you can see that he thinks it's the box that he's mm. talking about. But he's got to prove okay. it's the box that All Biden's right. talking yes. about. Now, uh, I'm not sure why, to be honest, he assumes that that was the box that he right. was talking about because literally – Straight after Biden said, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, the next words that comes out of his mouth is, I wrote the president a handwritten 40-page memorandum arguing against deploying additional troops to Iraq. Mm. That memorandum was classified. Ah. So he easily could have been talking about the memorandum. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not the box. Yes. The me he had many copies of memoranda that memorandum around his house yeah, yeah. and her treated that memorandum like notes, like right. personal notes. Yes, yeah, yeah. So he had the right to have that. Yeah, yeah. So if he was talking about the memorandum that he said directly after the, the magic yes. phrase, yeah, yeah, yeah. then there's no case to answer. Ah. But her thought he wasn't talking about that. Right. Her thought he was talking about the box. Mm. Uh, this is where me and her, we go down different roads. Okay, yeah. Because I think that's a pretty big assumption he made there. Oh. <laughs> it's a... Uh, now, uh, to beef it up, because he knew he had to make, make this case and it's not going to be easy, he mm. tried to come up with a motive that Biden would be hanging on to this box for. Right. He came up with a few ideas. Yep. Uh, so one, this is one of them. Page 95. Like many presidents, Mr. Biden had long viewed himself as a historic figure. Elected to the Senate at age 29, he considered running for president as early as 1980 and did so in 1988, 2008, and 2020. During his 36 years in the Senate, Mr. Biden believed he had built a record in both domestic and foreign affairs that made him worthy of the presidency. In addition to the notebooks and note cards on which he took notes throughout his vice presidency, Mr. Biden collected papers and artifacts related to noteworthy issues and events in his public life. He used these materials to write memoirs published in 2007 and 2017 to document his legacy and to cite as evidence that he was a man of presidential timber. So that's his motive. Mm. That he kept the box so he could write about it in his memoirs. Yeah. Except for we have the memoirs now. It's called Promise Me Dad. That's what it's called. It's called Promise Me Dad. And it's not about Afghanistan. He doesn't mention it. It's about Bo Biden dying yeah. and Biden's subsequent decision to not run for president in mm. 2016. That's what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he never, not only did he not write about Afghanistan yeah. in his book, but when they asked him in the interview about it, he testified under oath that he never intended to write about Afghanistan. Mm. So that kind of destroys the evidence for yes. that theory. Yeah, yeah. So then Hur took another shot. Page 116. He strongly opposed the military's effort to send large numbers of US troops to Afghanistan. And this opposition culminated in the lengthy handwritten memo Mr. Biden sent President Obama over the Thanksgiving holiday in 2009. By 2017, Mr. Biden believed his judgment, as reflected in the memo, had been vindicated by history. Mm. So he kept them as his vindication. Yeah. The documents proving it. Mm. But... Number one, he never mentioned this in his 2020 election campaign. No. So if he thought this was such a big deal, you yeah, think he yeah. would have mentioned it when he was running for president. Secondly, to prove that he had these views, he just need the memo. Mm. 
mm. which he had many copies of yes. in his house. Yes, yeah. He yeah. didn't need the the base documents. No. So that doesn't make sense either. No. Those are the only two motives that her comes up with, mm. and they're both garbage. Yes. Her then to try and bolster his case comes up with a photo analysis where he compares. It's, it's pretty poor to be honest. Uh, it, it's pretty <laughs> dubious. He tries to show that the box found in the Delaware garage in 2022 is the same box that appeared in two pictures taken in Biden's Delaware office in 2019, mm -hmm. shortly after he moved there when all his stuff was shipped from his Virginia home. Okay. And the way he tried to prove it was there was handwriting on one mm. on, on one of the uh, sleeves of the box. Yep. And you could just say, honestly, it's just the tiniest little, like it's like a little corner of handwriting. Mm. He goes, oh, that's clearly the same handwriting. Absolutely, it wasn't clearly the same handwriting, but mm. that was enough for him at that point yeah, in time because yeah, yeah. he's obviously desperate. And uh, the uh, and he said, and he then argued that since that was obviously not obviously that he believed that was the same box mm. and that had just been moved from his Virginia home, that proved he had the box in his Virginia home with the the folders. So that's how he tried to to connect them all together. Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, it's pretty shaky stuff. Very shaky. <laughs> and so. And that was all her had. Even her admitted that was all he had. Page yep. 218. Reasonable jurors who are unwilling to read too much into Mr. Biden's brief aside, does one it's a, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, may find a shortage of evidence to establish that Mr. Biden looked through the facts first folder. That's a folder, which is the only folder known to contain national defense information. So he admits it. Yeah. But... Given all that, I mean, you could tell that her really believed this theory. He's desperate to try yes. and prove it, and he believed it, but he didn't think he had enough, even then. And I agree with him. <laughs> and, and so he then said, he then explained why he felt this wasn't enough. This is the relevant section, page yep. 202. Mm -hmm. The folders of classified Afghanistan documents appear to be files of Mr. Biden's creation, labeled in his handwriting and containing memos and intelligence products he removed from the ordinary flow of paper he received as vice president. In the same box, this is all the evidence they're yep. saying there was. Yes, yeah, yeah. In the same box in the garage where FBI agents found the classified of Afghanistan documents, agents also found other documents of great personal importance mm. to Mr. Biden, yes. including photos of his son, Bo, oh. and documents Mr. Biden filed, accessed, and used in early 2017. During the same time, he told Zwanitsa he found the classified documents about Afghanistan in his, in his Virginia home. The evidence suggests that Mr. Biden maintained these files himself. Biden had a strong motive to keep the classified Afghanistan documents, believed President Obama's 2009 troop surge was a mistake on par with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He wanted record records to show that he was right about Afghanistan, that his critics were wrong, and he had opposed President Obama's mistaken decision forcefully when it was made, that his judgment was sound when it mattered most. The evidence provides grounds to believe that Mr. Biden willfully retained the marked classified documents about Afghanistan. If he was not referring to those documents later found in his garage, when he told Zwanitsa he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs, it is not clear what else Mr. Biden could have been referring to, apart from the memo, which he obviously was referring to. Nevertheless, for the reasons below, we believe this evidence is not strong enough to establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So he built up his case. He's saying, this is what I believe, this is what I believe, but we just don't have enough. That's right. That's the quote. Now, we've already rebutted that last bit. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're all enjoying Lichardello versus her. <laughs> I want to just quickly rebut the bit about Biden curating the box. Okay. He, he, said, he said that because there was, it was so, there was so much important stuff in there, he yeah. obviously part, uh, curated it. Now, Biden's lawyer kind of took care of that bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, Biden's lawyer said, your characterization of the box in the garage as containing only matters of great personal significance to the president is inconsistent with the facts. The evidence shows that this tattered box contained a random assortment of documents, including plainly unimportant ones, such as a short-term vacation lease, a VP-era memorandum on furniture at the <laughs> Naval Observatory, <laughs> talking points from speeches, campaign material, empty folders, a 1995 document commemorating Syracuse Law's 100-year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> and other random materials. And then he quoted... That's great. That's my favourite one. <laughs> yes. And then he quoted Biden's testimony as yeah. saying, when asked about the later dated material yeah, in the yeah. box, Biden said, 
See, that's what makes me think just people gathered up whatever they found and whenever the, the, the last thing was being moved. So stuff moving out of the vice president's residence at the end of the day, whatever they found, they put. Mm. They didn't separate it out, you know, speakers, bureau and pen or whatever the hell it is or bow. They just put it in a single box. That's the only thing I can think of. And by the way, her cited exactly that quality, that lots of random yes, stuff was yeah, jumbled yeah, yeah, yeah. up to conclude that the other boxes mm. in the, the university before of Delaware or whatever yeah. – um, that he dismissed before weren't curated by Biden. Right. Yeah. So I don't think he can prove that Biden was talking about that box. No. And in fact, uh, her himself admits this at another time. Well, not unless he <laughs> felt that the furniture decisions at the Naval Observatory <laughs> were among the great legacy that gave him presidential timber. <laughs> Those are your favourite quotes. These are my favourite quotes. Okay. While it is natural to assume that Mr. Biden put the Afghanistan documents in the box on purpose and they knew they were there, there is in fact a shortage of evidence on these points. We do not know why, how, or by whom the documents were placed in the box. We do not know whether or when Mr. Biden carefully reviewed the box's contents. In other words, he can't prove Biden put the documents in the box mm. and he can't prove Biden even knew they were in the box. Yes. That's a pretty big quote. This is before we get to the possible issue of dog disruption. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And also on page 168, he said, there are alternative explanations for how the Afghanistan documents got into the garage box mm -hmm. that are also consistent with the ev evidence described above. Uh Page three, he says, no witness, photo, email, text message, or any other evidence conclusively places the Afghanistan documents at the Virginia home in 2017. Bottom line, the documents might not have even been in his house. Oh, no. They couldn't prove anything. Oh, no. So, in conclusion, his logic was very suspect about this critical, yes. critical piece yes. of information. Yet... It was his logic. Mm. So why didn't he think they had they could they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Mm. He tells you why. This is when we get to the memory bit. Yes, yeah, yeah. Page two oh four. First, Mr. Biden could have found the classified Afghanistan documents at the Virginia home in twenty seventeen and then forgotten about them soon after. Mm. This could convince some reasonable jurors he did not willfully retain them. Page 209. The classified Afghanistan documents did not come up again in Mr. Biden's dozens of hours of recorded conversations with the ghostwriter or in his book. And the place where the Afghanistan documents were eventually found in Mr. Biden's Delaware garage in a badly damaged box surrounded by household detritus <laughs> suggests the documents might have been forgotten. This is not where a person intentionally stores what he supposedly considers to be important classified documents critical to his legacy. Rather, it looks more like a place a person stores classified documents he's forgotten about or is unaware of. Mm. Second, back to page 204, Mr. Biden might not have retained the classified Afghanistan documents in the Virginia home at all. They could have been stored without his knowledge at his Delaware home since the time he was vice president. This would rebut charges that he willfully retained the documents in Virginia. Mm. Third, Mr. Biden could have found only some of the classified Afghanistan documents in the Virginia home in 2017, the ones in the Manila Afghanistan folder, which was, by the way, is misspelled, A-F-G-A-N-A-S-T-A-N. That's how Joe Biden spells Afghanistan. <laughs> it is in his handwriting. Yeah, that's... Uh, and it's unclear whether this folder contained national defence information. This too would rebut charges that he willfully retained national defence information as required by criminal statutes. And finally, page 209, most significantly, Mr. Biden self-reported to the government that the Afghanistan documents were in his Delaware garage and consented to searches of his house to retrieve them and other classified materials. He also consented to searches of other locations and later in the investigation, he participated in an interview with our office that lasted more than five hours mm. and provide written answers to most of our additional written questions. Just as a person who destroys evidence and lies often proves his guilt, a person who produces evidence and cooperates will be seen by many to be innocent. Yes. As uh, on page 157, when interviewed, Mr. Biden's personal aide recalled that during the first week after the end of the administration, several weeks before Mr. Biden told Zwanitzer he just found all of the classified stuff downstairs, Mr. Biden discovered classified material at the Virginia home and directed the age to return it mm. to the White House. So, he actually handed it yes. over. So in conclusion, three out of the four likely defences yeah. revolved around Biden being a well-meaning mm. but a kind of hopeless old guy. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's what sets up this, yes. th th this old thing, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. He didn't, for people who say that he stitched Biden up mm. and he was trying to get him, there's a reason he brought it up. Because yes, yeah, yeah. all the defences he came up with yes, yeah, yeah. involved Biden being a bit hopeless. Yes, right? yeah. 
Uh, I think though that, and, and I think the media has has misinterpreted this because they're acting like it's the only reason Biden wasn't prosecuted. Right. When in reality, uh, and that opens people up to asking if he's too senile to be charged, why is he too senile to be president? Mm. But in reality, that that's not what the report says. It says that him having a foggy memory is just one more reason. Yes, yeah. That they believe they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt to mm. a reasonable jury. I've gone through all the other reasons yes. for you. There's yeah, plenty yeah, yeah. of them, okay? Uh, this is the assessment we all know, we've all heard. Page 208. Mr. Biden's memory also appears to have significant limitations, both at the time he spoke to Mr. Zwanzer in 2017, as evidenced by their recorded conversations, and today, as evidenced by his recorded interview with our office. Mr. Biden's recorded conversations with Mr. Zwanzer from 2017 are often painfully slow, with Mr. Biden struggling to remember events and straining at times to read and relay his own notebook entries. In his interview with our office, Mr. Biden's memory was worse. He didn't remember when he was vice president, forgetting on the first day of the interview when his term ended. If it was 2013, when did I stop being vice president? And forgetting on the second day of the interview when his term began. In 2009, am I still vice president? He didn't remember, even with several years, w- within several years, when his son Bo died. And his memory appeared hazy when describing the Afghanistan debate that was once so important to him. Amongst other things, he mistakenly said he had a real difference of opinion with General Carl Eikenbury, when in fact Eikenbury was an ally whom Mr. Biden cited approvingly in his Thanksgiving memo to President Obama, in a case where the government must prove that Mr. Biden knew he had possession of the classified Afghanistan documents after the vice presidency and chose to keep those documents, knowing he was violating the law. We expect that at trial, his attorneys would emphasize these limitations in his recall. Mm. So that's the end, essentially, of the report. Right. Okay. Now, to be clear, Heard didn't say that Biden was too senile to, to stand trial. No, no. He just said he's forgetful enough that yes. people might believe he forgot at one point in time seven years ago yes. to have said eight words. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what he's saying. Yeah. And I think that's quite credible. Yes. <laughs> that's, it is. Uh now it's the now we get to the reaction to this. Mm. Do, do you have any thoughts so far? Before no, 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 no. Okay, all right. I'm yeah, do, yeah. doing well. The spin from from Biden's people yes. has been nothing short of pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Molly Jong Fast. Let's play what she has to say. I would say yeah. I don't think that her is a good faith actor, and I think that no. 345 pages of that show that. I mean, he's not a neurologist, right? If you want to weigh in <laughs> on legal things, that's fine. He's not a neurologist. He should stick to the legal stuff. Okay. Well, he didn't express any neurological opinions. No. He just said what he, as an experienced prosecutor, thought would be convincing to a jury. Mm. That's all he said. Yeah. That's his job. Mm. He didn't diagnose Biden. He just explained how Biden presents himself yeah. and why. Yes. This is the next spin. This is Joe, Joe Scarborough saying, hey, I've forgotten my own mother's death. Nobody's closer to me. Nobody's been closer to me in my life than my mom. If somebody asked me in the middle of the deposition, what year did your mom die? I go, I don't know, 2017, 2018, 2019. I don't know. I can tell you everything about it. I can tell you my final word. But, but, but again, that and same thing with Mika and her dad. That's a heroic attempt from Joe Scarborough. But honestly, him. I've, a, I've actually heard more than one person make some variant of that argument. Yeah. Well, I've also heard people say that they've deliberately forgotten uh, dates like that. Given that that given given that Joe Biden yes didn't run for president yes in 2016 mm. because of the ramifications of his son's death yeah it's not hard to, for him to know around the time his son died. Right. I think. But, you know, let's, uh, I, I mean, you might disagree. I, I think that's unconvincing spin, personally. Yeah. Uh, Biden's lawyer's spin, however, I think is much more convincing. Biden's lawyer said that the the president was, oh, sorry, no, this, this bit's unconvincing. Yeah. The president was distracted during his deposition because it came just hours after the October 7 massacre. Yeah, you don't remember when you're vice president because this is a few hours after the, the, the October 7. Come on. All right, that's not convincing. But... Uh-huh. This is a, sorry. What are you gonna say? Oh, look, I do just think dates are not necessarily the most salient parts of people's memories. Okay, so when Joe Scarborough says, "I remember everything else about mm. it," I don't remember the exact date. Mm. Um, uh, I can believe that. You know, you when you read people's memoirs of war, they'll say at some point in might have been 1943, might have been 1944. Mm. And they're describing some incredibly important event in their life. Um, they get it wrong. I've got enough experience of 
hearing people get hearing people be vague about dates um, while being very lucid about a lot of other information that I think I can understand vagueness on dates. Uh, well, yeah. Well, what I would say is I'd say 2016 is not. 1943. Right, yes. And I'd also, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. And I'd also say that her specifically said he was more than a few years off right, as yes. well. Okay. Uh, but thirdly, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the four memory issues, yes, yeah, three yeah. of them involve dates. Yes. Bynes obviously got a problem with dates. Yeah, yeah. Like, which is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. I'm, I'm not saying he's senile. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, like I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm yeah, not saying, yeah. I'm not saying he, he can't function as president. Yes, yeah. I'm just saying, uh, but, but the, uh, yeah, I, uh, and the fourth one, the fourth memory issue was Carl Eikenbury was yeah, an yeah. argument they had like 14 years ago. Mm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that's, that's unsurprising. Yes. Yeah, so I do agree with you in that respect. Yeah. This defence I thought was better though. From the lawyer, we do not believe the report's treatment of President Biden's memory is accurate or appropriate. The report uses highly prejudicial language to describe a commonplace occurrence amongst witnesses, a lack of recall of years-old events. Such comments have no place in the Department of Justice report, particularly one that in the first paragraph announces that no criminal charges are warranted and that the evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt. The same predictable memory loss occurred with other witnesses in this investigation. Yet unlike your treatment of President Biden, your report accepts other witnesses' memory loss as completely understandable given the passage of time. Page 238. McGrail's memory of these events could well have faded over the course of more than six years. Another one that he cites is him saying, his memory, must, his memory was fuzzy on that point, page 265. And the events on which you found the lawyer's memory to be fuzzy occurred only a few months before the interview, whereas Biden's memory was about conversations he had six years earlier. Mm. I think that's a reasonable yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, that's reasonable. A, uh, now, my, my point of view on this is mm. that the memory point was essential. Yep. I think talking about Bo Biden's the Bo Biden death and the vice presidential stuff yep. is not essential. Okay. And I'll tell you why I think it wasn't essential. Yep. Because on page 219, he didn't do that. Right. He said, Mr. Biden will likely present himself to the jury as he did during his interview with our office as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Mm. While he is and must be accountable for his actions, he is, after all, the President of the United States. Based on our direct observations of him, Mr. Biden is someone for whom many jurors will want to search for reasonable doubt. It would be difficult to convince a jury they should convict him by then, a former president who would be at least well into his 80s yep. of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. Yes. I thought that was fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all he needed to say. Yep. Now, I know other people criticised him for saying a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory loss. Yes. Poor memory. I think that that was that was legit. I think he was pushing it a bit far when he was rubbing it in a bit, I think, with the vice presidential stuff. Yeah. Personally. Okay, yeah. Um, and recall Rod Rosenstein's memo when they sacked James Comey. Derogatory information sometimes is disclosed in the course of criminal investigations or prosecutions, but we never release it gratuitously. Mm. The FBI director laid out his version of the facts for the news media as if it were a closing argument, but without a trial. It's a textbook case of what federal prosecutors and agents are taught not to do. Mm. So that's what you want to avoid. Yep. Any thoughts so far? Um no, not really. Okay, let's go through some of the arguments that have been used. Two tiers there's a two tiered standard of justice. How often have you heard that? Do we even have to address this one? Well, we should because 53% of Americans polled agree that Biden received special treatment because he's the US president. That's, um, that's Ipsos. Okay. That's Ipsos. Okay. Trump's big on that one. <laughs> he says if you don't prosecute Biden, you shouldn't prosecute me. Uh, firstly, Robert Hur is a Republican. Let's remind everyone yes, of that. Yes, a Trump appointee. Yes. Yes. And he gave Biden a good clipping on the way through, as we just discussed. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, he... He couldn't make the case. I've made that very clear. Yeah. By contrast, the case against Trump was so easy to make that even Alina Haber could have made it. <laughs> Her himself made the difference between Biden and Trump very clear on yes. page 11. Yeah. Unlike the evidence involving Mr. Biden, the allegations set forth in the indictment of Mr. Trump, if proven, would present serious aggravating facts. Most notably, after being given multiple chances to return classified documents and avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. Mm. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. In contrast, Mr. Biden turned in classified documents to the National Archives and the Department of Justice, consented to the search of multiple locations, including his homes, sat for a voluntary interview and in other ways cooperated with the investigation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, which, by the way, contradicts what Trump has been saying endlessly, which was... I cooperated with the very unfriendly and hostile feds. I cooperated far more than Biden did, who sent records to Chinatown. 
I just include that because of the Chinatown. <laughs> Remember, it's his staff that put it there. Yes. And Trump, you're full of shit. <laughs> Everyone knows you are. Um, according, uh, yeah, and okay, so and then we get to, oh, yeah, I got, I got, I got a question for you here. Mm. Okay, that's, that's all I have to say about that bit. Yes, yeah, yeah. Andy McCarthy, the conservative lawyer, yes. had an interesting suggestion. What's that? Now, most of the reasons for the suggestion were bullshit, yeah. in my view. Yeah. But I thought one of them was mm. super compelling. Okay, what's that? He said that Biden should pardon Trump of the classified documents charges. Right. He said in Florida, he said that he should just pardon him for those charges, not for the obstruction charges. These were his reasons, many of which I disagree with, mm. but one I think is a great reason. See if you can guess which one it is. Okay. Number one, it would resolve the inconsistency with his case and Biden's case in some people's eyes. Mm -hmm. Biden could say, I don't think there are two tiers of justice, but I know many people do, so I'll make this gesture as a sign of goodwill. Number two, it would allow Biden to appear magnanimous as a contrast to Trump being his aggressive, rude mm. self. Three, it would allow Biden to be a unifier in an election year, which is his shtick. Mm. Four, Trump would have to admit to wrongdoing to accept the pardon, mm. which he would not like to do and would compromise the impression he likes to create to his fans of him doing no wrong. Mm. Five, it would get Trump's Florida trial happening. <laughs> That's your reason. <laughs> That's my reason. That's your reason. Right now, the trial is bogged down in classified document discovery. Yes. And clearances and administrative yeah, and yeah. admissibility issues. Yeah. Even without Trump's favourite judge, Eileen Cannon, yes. uh, uh, in charge, it would likely take all year. The rest of them I don't think very much No, of, same here. Because they've got nothing to do with the law or justice. And or also, yeah. Parsons are going to pass him, yes. as if he'd convince one person. I know, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just really. Um, uh, with Eileen Cannon in charge, there is zero chance that trial happens before the election. Yeah. Zero, okay? But if you remove the classified document content from the picture... Mm. And you got you got Trump to admit his guilt to them, by the way, as well. Yeah, yeah. And then you focus no obstruction. You could get that trial happening in a few months, mm. all right? And then you could guarantee a conviction before the election. Yeah. Because the evidence for obstruction is very strong. Very, very strong. Okay. Yes. I reckon if I was Biden, yeah. I would do whatever I could to get a conviction. Mm. So I think he should do that. Okay. Just for that reason. Wow. Now he won't. But what do you, what do you think? Well, it's not very often that we agree with uh, Andrew C. McCarthy <laughs> on this, but you're right, that is a compelling point. <laughs> yes. Okay, the, from the Democrat side, there's an, there's an argument, they're, they're arguing about, was it a stitch-up from the Republican prosecutor? Right. All right the, uh, it seemed to me that her clearly thought Biden was guilty and yep. was desperately trying to concoct a reason to charge him, but I think, also think he was fair. Yeah, yeah. Even though I think he was wrong with mm. a few things, I yep. still think he was fair. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, and he also put it all out there, so yes, I could, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I could, I could disprove him. Yes, that yeah, yeah, information yeah, yeah. all came from him. Yes, so yeah, so good yeah, on yeah. him. Yeah, he was transparent. Yes, yeah? um, I think a better question, which I ask you, yes, is why do Democrats always pick Republican co prosecutors, and Republicans never pick Democrat <laughs> prosecutors, and <laughs> Democrats keep on doing that, even though they never get any points for picking Republican right, prosecutors. Yes, yeah, yeah. Even as soon as a Republican prosecutor finds in favour of Democrat, everyone goes, oh, that's his own Department of Justice. Yeah. That's just that's just his administration doing this. Yeah, yeah. Even though they picked a Republican. I mean, it, do, do you agree with me that this is, this is self-defeating and weird? Yeah, but, you know, it's what they believe. This is, this is what the Merrick Garlands of the world believe. Mm. This is what they believe in. No, I, I, I'm not saying you should pick a hack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can't you just pick someone who might be an independent for once? Mm. <laughs> like just just for once. Is there such a thing? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Is there such a thing? I don't know. Okay, the next question. Well, you talk about Merrick Garland. Yes. Should he have released? Should he have released the the uh, report as it was, or should he have censored it, or at least asked for edits? Because apparently Biden's pissed off at Garland for not demanding edits to the report. Mm. Uh, that's yeah. That, Imagine if that had come out. That's exactly my point. Yeah, yeah. There is a one hundred percent chance it would have been leaked. Yes, yeah, yeah. One hundred percent chance. I think Merrick Garland was in a no-win situation yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I think that the yeah if it if exactly if it came out through leaks yeah it would have been the same thing. In fact, it would have been blown up more. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And also Biden would have looked corrupt. Yep. So um, yeah, no, I think Garland did the right, and it's the right thing for Garland to do as well. There's yeah. no, there's no actual legitimate reason to censor that report at all. Yeah. So he didn't. So good on it. Mm. I don't like Garland much, but I like him for that. Okay, good. Um, 
And by the way, Biden could have exerted executive privilege over it if he wanted to. Yeah. He chose not to, mm. which is also good. Yep. All right. So um, uh, also, can I make the point that they should lean into that? Mm. Like Biden should be constantly talking about how much he hates the report. Yes. And like uh, to, to demonstrate that it wasn't a hometown report. Yes. It was a Republican and I didn't like it. I don't think they should have included it. Mm. Uh I think that would help him if he said that kind of stuff. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. Anyway, do you think, my question to you now yep. is do you think this is a big deal or not? Yes, I do think it's a big Why? deal. Um, because this- I'm talking about the memory stuff now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Biden's age is, I think at this point, the single biggest drag mm -hmm. on him. Yeah. And as we've said before, it's the issue that he can do the least about. Yeah. The economy can get better- Ceasefire in Gaza can be reached. Yep. He can't get any younger mm. and he can't look any younger. Mm. The best he can hope for is that people start noticing how deranged Trump is, but mm. I don't know what the chances of that are given how used to it uh, people actually are. Yeah. So this is the – and when I say, like, I think this is the single biggest problem that uh, Biden has, it's because when you look at people who actually might be – wavering, mm. right, who actually might be, you know, considering voting for Biden but who also might vote against him. This is the kind of thing they're looking at. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people I know who I would describe as generally sympathetic to Biden are also saying things like, every time I see him he looks like he's about to fall over. Mm. Um, but can I ask you? Yes. That is, I mean, we'll get to this yeah, yeah, in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's the old thing generally. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was already old before this report came out. Yes, Why yes. does this report make any difference? Like people okay. can see he's old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There are, I think, a couple of reasons yeah. why. Mm. One is just that it puts it um, back into the centre of things and it also, like the, you know, phrases in the report, that's campaign fodder, yeah. right? It, it provides... A specific, like her, um, you know, the specific kind of phrasing that he used, mm. that's we're going to be hearing that all the time. Mm. Um, but second is that, you know, for Americans who still kind of appeal to traditional sources of authority to settle disputes, legal, medical, mm. whatever, this is an authoritative yeah. source saying Biden's memory is shot to pieces. Yeah. This is an authoritative source saying, yes, what you are seeing is correct, mm. right? Your suspicions are correct. He really is old. It really does affect his memory. Yeah. Um, now, even if people have uh, read far too much into what Hers said, as you said, he mm. wasn't saying he wasn't prosecuted only because he was too senile. Mm. Um, uh, nonetheless, you do have an authoritative source there saying, uh, that, um, you know, Biden's memory is so bad that it would make it, you know, that it would make it difficult to convince a jury that he had the intent to keep these documents. Mm. Um, that's a level of authority that we haven't really seen yeah. before when it, it comes to these uh, questions of his age. Like we haven't seen any medical assessments mm. saying that he's, uh, you know, that he's suffering from memory loss or that he's too old to be president. Um, prior to this, it's all been, have you, you know, did you see that clip of Biden the other night? Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's what people have been talking about in the media. It's what his political opponents have been mm. um, talking about. Now we have got somebody in a position of legal authority who was put there by the Biden administration actually um, saying the same thing and saying it in very eloquent, if unfair, terms. Yeah. So I do think that... This ratchets that <laughs> it ratchets that issue um, up another level. It, I mean, I don't think the issue was ever going away in mm. the first place, but it ensures that it stays in a very specific place. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I I do wonder, like, what would have done more damage? You know, that report as it was phrased, or a more simple kind of. Um, uh, you know, we found evidence that he retained documents. The reason why we're not charging him is because you can't charge a sitting president. Mm. Like, what, what would have actually done? I think that might have been better. Well, I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. And, um, I mean, th that obviously would have brought all kinds of other problems mm. with it as well. Uh, but as it is, um, you've got his biggest political weakness being 
you know, dragged out into the open and uh, really kind of um, just, yeah, put into a position of authority that it wasn't in before. I must admit, John said something very similar last week on Planet America. Yeah. And I disagree with him and I was wrong. <laughs> like at the time when this first broke, I just thought, oh, who cares about what this dude thinks? Mm. Like we've seen 50 clips of Biden seeming like he's too old. Yes, yeah, like yeah. it doesn't change anything. But no, I think John said exactly what you said. He said it's a permission structure yes, for, yeah, yeah, for the yeah. mainstream media to cover this now like it's a legitimate story. Yes. Yeah. And, the, uh, and he's right. And yeah. you're both being proven right by the fact that the Instapols direct. Well, for a start, the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal ran. Take a guess how many articles in the next four days <laughs> about Biden's memory. Well, take be- a guess between them. Between them, the three of them combined. Uh, I'm gonna guess ninety. Eighty-one. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> okay, Pretty good. Yeah. So the permission, the permission structure was definitely in yes, effect. Yep. And if you look at the Instapols, yep. Until that point in time, mm-hmm. sixty-five to seventy-five percent of People were saying Biden was too old to serve another term. Yep. After that weekend, yeah, yeah. Uh, ABC Ipsos poll: eighty-six percent said Biden was too old to yeah. serve out a full term. Seventy-three percent of Democrats, yeah, yeah, said yeah. he was too old. As a comparison, sixty-two percent of adults said Trump was too old. Fifty-nine yeah. percent said both were too old. Yeah. Put this in context. Yes. YouGov in yeah. twenty eighteen, yes, yeah. found eighty-four percent of Americans, so fewer, yes, yeah, were sure that the Earth is round. <laughs> So more, more people thought that, yeah, yeah. that Biden is too old to run for president again than they thought the earth was round in 2018. Yes. So, so I think you're right. Yeah. You've been vindicated. I mean, and it's, it's possible that, you know, some of that will fade, but there's just going to be too much to keep reminding people. Did the presser make afterwards make a big difference or not? Like was he done? Was he done anyway at that point in time, or did the or did the, the, the fact that in particularly stuffed up the Egypt? Yeah, Mexico the press didn't up. help. I'll, I'll play it for, for you guys at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, as you know, initially the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. So he messed up. He said that the president of yeah. of Mexico was CC, not Egypt. Yeah. Now that is not the most egregious fuck up that I've no. ever seen. I reckon it, most of the people watching the press conference wouldn't even realize. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Like it was obviously it was very clear what he was uh, yeah. what he was saying. He got the name of the uh, mm. he got the name of the country wrong. Mm. Um, but yeah, that that clearly didn't help. Mm. Um, having said that, I think the real damage was done by the special counsel yeah. report itself. I, I agree. I mean, the, the only thing I would say about that press conference yep. is that and I did say this on Play America as well. That that I think it's worth pointing out that yep. if you took away the Egypt Mexico stuff up, yes, that was an answer about off the cuff about Israel, yes, which yeah, is a, yeah. a tough topic, yes, especially for him at the moment, yeah, 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 which was coherent, yep. and intelligent and made sense. It yes. was slow as all hell, yes, like yeah. everything he says these days, mm. yeah, but it actually showed policy understanding, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is more than I can say for Trump when he talks yes, about policy. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And the uh, and I think it actually, I think it actually showcased the issue. Yes, for yeah, Biden. Yeah. That yeah. that like the issue for Biden is that he still has, can do policy, but yes. he presents increasingly poorly right, when he yeah, does. Yeah. Whereas Trump presents fine, yeah, yeah. but can't talk about the substance. As it turns out, America is full of people. Yes. Who don't understand policy. Yes, yeah, But yeah. really care about presentation. Yes. So Trump suits them. Yeah, yeah. It, um, that's yep. the problem. Yeah. 86% possibly. Yes, no, I <laughs> agree. Like I, I don't think that Biden lacks the mental acuity mm. to be president. Mm. Uh, his problems are physical. Now, as I've said before, it is, it's always a fraught distinction, that, between physical and mental. <laughs> um, but... Nonetheless, when I look at Biden, I do think it's physical problems rather than mental problems. Yeah. With with Trump, it's really serious mental problems. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, what do you think of the argument? There's a few, a few arguments. We're getting to the general old stuff now. Yes, okay? yeah, Just yeah. trying the old stuff. Do you have anything to say generally about old stuff before we get into some particular topics? Um, David French had uh, mm-hmm. an interesting article yep. on this, which I think is um, – it, it's going to be what a lot of people are saying, which is uh, essentially that a lot of people are familiar with having 
arguments with an elderly relative, yeah. that elderly relative being the last person to realise that they've lost the ability to mm. do something yeah. uh, like drive. And he's saying mm. this is going to be a really serious problem for Biden because mm. too many people can relate to that, uh, yeah, to that yeah. situation. I think that's true. And I think that that, that on that note, there's been a few defences of him. Like yep. there's been a bunch of people talking about how sharp he is, which is extremely unconvincing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are, like John Stewart, I thought actually in his monologue had a great take on that, which mm. I'll okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play it now. Yep. President Biden, who I've been around uh, numerous times just in this last year, is sharp. He's focused. He's bright. He is sharp, intensely probing, and detail oriented and focused. This is a man who is sharp, who is on top of his game, who knows what's going on. He's smart. He's on his game. I was in almost every meeting with the president, and the president was in front of and on top of it all, coordinating and directing leaders who are in charge of America's national security, not to mention our allies around the globe. Did anyone Film that. <laughs> because if you're if you're telling us behind the scenes he is sharp and full of energy and on top of it and really in control and leading, you should film that. <laughs> that would be good to show to people instead of a TikTok where he goes. <laughs> See, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, yes. it, I mean, he made a joke of it, but he's true. Yes, like yeah, yeah, yeah. people co- constantly say how how wonderful he is without yeah, yeah. us ever seeing any evidence of that. Yes, is extremely unconvincing. It is. Yeah, <laughs> and also, I I just want to make a point. Mm. Look, Bernie Sanders is older than both Trump yeah, and Biden. He is, and he looks way more together, both physically and mentally. Yeah. Than either of them. Like, yes, he's got a serious stoop at this point. <laughs> yes. When he says, You are a United States Senator, sit down. <laughs> like, that's th- true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, yeah. Like, he, he doesn't show like that he's lost anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah so, but there was a lot, a lot of discourse about him being, uh, him being too old. Yeah, no, you're right. You're yeah. right, right. I think another thing which a lot of people have, um, Made the, not, not a lot of people, some yeah, people have yeah. made the point, is that Biden has been a gaff machine forever. He has been, yeah. Like all the, like him stuffing up. I mean, this is one from yes. 2008 yep. I've got here. My friends, I don't have to tell you, this election year the choice is clear. One man stands ready to deliver change we desperately need. A man I'm proud to call my friend. A man who will be the next president of the United States, Barack America. <laughs> Barack America. <laughs> so yeah, I mean like that yeah, that that, yeah. that seems kind of senile. That yes. was that was almost 20 years ago. Yeah, and uh uh like and, and I'll, I'll tell you the problem though. The problem yeah. is this. This is him. I'll play you him having a brain freeze in 2021. And the okay. reason I'm going to play it yep. is I want you to see what he was like mm. in 2021. Okay. Yep. And this is the issue, how rapidly he has degraded physically. Okay. Look at how he conducts himself in 2021 yep. and then there's the brain freeze. Okay. As you observed, I'm a fairly practical guy. I want to get things done. I want to get them done consistent with what we promised the American people. And in order to do that, in a 50-50 Senate, we've got to get to the place where I get 50 votes so that the Vice President of the United States can break the tie, or I get 51 votes without her. And so I'm going to say something outrageous. I have never been particularly poor at calculating how to get things done in the United States Senate. So the best way to get something done, if you if it holds near and dear to you that you uh, um, like to be able to, anyway, I'm, we're going to get a lot done. And the classic anyway, but, my, <laughs> but, 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 but you see my point. That's the kind of brain freeze that if it happened right now, people yes. would go nuts about. Yeah, yeah. But right there, 
His eyes are much wider. Mm -hmm. He's speaking much quicker. He seems sure of himself. Yes. You notice at the moment, everything he says, he sounds like he's mm. unsure of himself. Yes. Like he just he just has more presence there. Yes, yeah. It's the the fact he's dropped off so much in two or three years, I think, is the issue. Yeah. I think people are seeing that. Yep. In fact, I actually watched a press conference of his from January 2023 the other day. Right, yep. He looks different in the mm. last 12 months. Yep. And we all know that when people drop off when they get older, sometimes they drop off real quick. Yeah. And he is in the middle of that right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's the problem. Yes. I don't think it's the slip, slip ups. Yeah. I think it's the slip ups in, like, people have noticed, but Mike Johnson made a slip up the other day on Meet the Press. He said, yes, yeah. We passed the support for Iran many months ago. Instead, we passed the support for Israel. Yes. Jesse Waters got South Carolina mixed up with South Dakota, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and that was directly after slagging off Biden's memory. Yeah. Like, who thinks that Jesse Waters' brain is functioning properly? No one. Yeah. But the point is that. That the it's not the slip ups that are the issue. Mm. It's it's the degradation with yes. the slip ups. Yep. I don't say anyone. Yep. And as you say, it's Biden's knock. Yes. When everyone's gone knock. Yep. Paul Begala talked about this as well the other day. He said, you know, if when Obama said fifty seven states, it didn't hurt him. Yeah. Because he wasn't he wasn't the stupid one. Yeah. yeah he yeah, was yeah. the elitist one. Yes. You know, if George Bush had said that, it would have hurt him. Yes. Yeah, you know, so the uh, and we so with when Biden, it's old. So every time he does something old, it hurts mm. him. Yep. Okay. Um, should he resign? Should Biden resign? Yes. Um, like, is it too late? What, uh, what do you? Oh, is it too late? Yeah. Like from from, from a strategic point of view, yeah. is, is the best thing for the Democrats for him to resign? Right. Now, obviously, they can't get rid of him, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he yeah. has to choose. Right? Yeah. If they tried, to, if they dragged him out of the White House, that would be horrible. Yes. But. If he decided tomorrow, shit, this ain't working. I'm getting, I'm getting, this is becoming a problem, and he resigned. Would that be the best, the best option for the Democrats or not? Uh, that's a very good question. Mm. I think, and I think it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to say. So the obvious precedent to that is Lyndon Johnson. Yep, and that didn't work out. It didn't work out. <laughs> no, mm. I, I mean the assassination of one of his potential replacements didn't help. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah, we're not sure, you know, how it would have panned out if Bobby Kennedy had stayed alive. But, um, yeah, it would certainly be a very fraught exercise mm. uh, because, as we have discussed before, um, there are a lot of Democrats who wouldn't feel that Kamala Harris is the appropriate mm. uh, replacement. There would be there would be a definite competition, yeah. let's put it that way. There'd be uh, – and it could be quite a damaging process. Mm. Um we're, yeah. Uh, by the way, one one thing that I think is just worth putting to bed straight away is there's been a lot of excited chatter on the right about how the fact that in the betting markets, <laughs> Michelle Obama keeps coming up. The betting markets are always wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you've got, there are right wing commentators saying that must mean that there's something to this, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they could replace uh, Biden with Michelle Obama. Now, as someone writing in Politico, I can't remember who pointed out, there's always this, they could replace Biden with Michelle Obama as if there's some authority yeah. that is actually sitting at the top of the Democratic Party that could do that, okay? There isn't. No. Um, I don't quite know where the Michelle Obama thing comes from other than the fact that people think, hey, that would be a good idea. She's a very popular figure within the Democratic Party. And that she's black. Yeah. yeah. Um, and They're going, you can't re if you want to replace Kamala, yeah. Kamala Harris, you need a black woman. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's one half of it. The other yeah. half of it is that for Republicans, Michelle Obama represents some kind of cross between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Yes. In other words, she'd be the ultimate hate figure. <laughs> yes. Like that's who they really want to, yeah. uh, that's who they really want to hate. But Just like they were saying Hillary Clinton was going to come back in yes, 2020. Yes, exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but, you know, first of all, uh, anybody who wants the nomination is going to have to fight very hard for it. It's mm. not like someone can just be uh, mm. subbed in, not even Kamala Harris. Um, second, Michelle Obama hasn't shown any inclination towards this whatsoever and hasn't laid any kind of groundwork for it, whereas there are plenty of people who have yep. uh, laid, uh, laid groundwork. So let's put that rumour to bed yeah. uh, straight away. Michelle Obama is not coming to save you, mm. <laughs> um, either from your own boredom or from mm. uh, from from Joe Biden. Um, yeah, I mean, 
certainly there's part of me that thinks that Democrats would be better off with another candidate, but there's another part of me that feels that if that had happened sometime early last year, then yeah. uh, they'd be in a much better position now. Um, as someone else, oh, same author in Politico. Sorry that I can't remember who you are, Politico mm-hmm. author. They're a pepper. Uh, yeah, as, as they pointed out, um, you know, it was that midterm election that really saved Biden's bacon. Mm. If there had been a red wave in that, there would have been far more serious challenges than mm. than what we've seen because mm. uh, it was around that time that there were all those polls saying that a majority of Democrats didn't want Biden to run again. Yeah. Um, uh, that that election was what cemented Biden's, you know, it, it was what cemented Biden's position in the sense that Democrats thought it would be more damaging to challenge him than to uh, just leave him alone. Now I think it probably is too late. Mm. Um, yeah, if he resigned now, well, but then again, you don't know how it would play out. But Biden is not so far behind that, like, it's time to complete, you know, that it's time to strap the parachute on. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, it all, all is not lost uh, yet. It, so, yeah, I, I don't know. The problem I think he faces yes. is that, oh, by the way, I, I don't think he should resign. Okay. But yeah. I think that, because I think that I, I'm of the view that whoever replaced him yeah, yeah. would have, would inherit all the same issues apart yeah, yeah. from age. It, it would also raise the question, like, it, if he's, well, if he announced he wasn't going to run again, people would be asking, well, why are you still doing it? Now? Why are you still in the job now? Mm. Like, if you're not well enough to run it, if you don't have it together enough to run again, mm. like, why uh, why are you well enough to be president now? He could resign right now. He could. But, um, but yeah, and then, and yeah, well, I, look, I, yeah. I don't think he should resign. Yeah. But having said that, because I, I, I think it's very easy for people to catastrophize right now, yes, but yeah, I yeah. think that the, the alternative will probably be worse. Yes, yeah, yeah. But- Having said that, I don't think we should underestimate how bad the situation is. No. I know he's only three points behind or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But this is not the end of the issue. No. This is going to happen 20 more times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every incident, it's going to get bigger Mm -hmm. and bigger and bigger. Like like, this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. As I said, the only thing that can mitigate it is people realising how demented Trump actually is, Mm -hmm. Um, which is not out of the realm of possibility, Mm -hmm. but- yeah. Yeah. And I think for those who watch the press conference and wondering why the feeding frenzy was so intense, I think it's because this is like the 10th time this has happened. Yeah. And like in the 11th time will be bigger. And yeah. the 12th time will be bigger. Mm-hmm. And you know the Republicans are going to do everything they can yes. to keep in the news. They're going to yeah, yeah. get Robert Hurd. They're going to have him up for, up for a hearing in yeah. the House. They're going to try and subpoena the audio recordings and yes. then they're going to leak them out. Yeah, yeah. That will be a news story. I promise you. Probably in August or September, they'll release the audio recordings where he sounds painfully slow. Yes. Like that, they're coming. Yeah. Right. And they don't, they'll keep on and, and, and he'll stuff up. Mm. And at some point in time, he's going to trip down the stairs and there's just going to be one of them and there'll be another one. There'll be another, so it's going to be bad. Mm. But uh, once again, like I always say, the, re- the election campaign commences again as soon as there's a proper trial. Yes. The January 6th trial happens. Yeah. It's a brand new election campaign. Yep. The age stuff will keep going, yes. but Trump will have his own problems at that point in time. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so I looked at, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll talk about this a lot more, but I just mm. wanted to go through a bunch of the things that people are talking about. Oh, there's Actually, there's one more problem for, for Biden, yeah. and that's this. There's an obvious thing he can do. When you say, what can he do about it? Yeah. There's a few things he can do. He can, he can use humour. Mm-hmm. which he already is using, oh, yes. by the way. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. he had one the other day, which I thought was pretty good. I know it don't look like it. I've been around a while. <laughs> I do remember that. (laughs) Yeah, look, he's not going to, he's not going to win the Melbourne Comedy Festival Award or anything. He's not going to have a Netflix special, but like (laughs) at least he showed good humor. It's better than being angry and crutchety about it. Mm, That's one thing you can do. You can show humor about it. Mm. You can own it Mm. (laughs) because you can't run away from it. So you might as well own it. But the other thing that's obvious is he needs to get out there. Yeah. Like the guy has done fewer press conferences than any president in the last hundred years, mm. apart from Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. Yeah, yeah. Right, in the last hundred years. Yeah. Like I said this on Play America, he's done in his first two years he had fifty four presses. Guess mm. how many Trump did in the first two years? Oh, like 
Two hundred. Two hundred and two. Yeah. Well done. Oh my god, yeah. I'm getting very close to these numbers a- today. Obama did two seventy five. Mm. So, yeah, so he just needs to get out there more. But the thing is, people aren't gonna watch him because he's boring. Yes, yeah. What they'll watch is the gaff. Mm. The more he gets out there, the more gaffs there'll be. And yeah. that's his problem. Yes. He needs to get out there, but that will create more material. Yeah. Now personally I think he just needs to he just needs to swallow it. Yeah. He just needs to just keep on doing it because he needs to at the moment, people are catastrophizing in their head what he really is like. Yep. They need to know what he's really like yes. by seeing him all the time. Yep. And if it if that's not good enough, he should resign right now. Yes. But if it is good enough, he should just get out there. And mm-hmm. I think part of the problem is he's been hidden from the from the people too much. Yeah. And so that's I think that's part of his problem. Um. But anyway, so yeah, so there's that as well. And the other thing I, I would suggest is I reckon he should challenge Trump for three debates right now. Right. Because Trump is already goading him about debates. Yeah. Yeah. Say, so, yeah, sure, mm. let's have three debates. And the reason why, mm. you cannot have lower expectations than he has right now. Yeah, that's and true. And debates are all about expectations. Yes, yeah. I promise you, he will win those debates. Mm. Like at least compared to the expectations. <laughs> yes, yeah. Like, uh, like he, he'll come out looking great. Yes. So he should uh, he should just, just lock him down right now should, and get on the front foot about it. Mm. Anyway, whatever. Um, anything else to say about this topic? Because, oh, cognitive exam. Do you think you should take a cognitive exam? That's, that's going to be the next thing. I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that, I mean, look, if he decides that, that Trump is going to make him take a cognitive, cognitive exam, which I think he probably is, he might as well just get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Because there's nothing worse than, than, yeah. than Trump getting cycle after cycle of publicity going on about it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but if he can avoid it, it's not going to help. The no. cognitive exam is not going to help. No, no, no. Like no. it's like the birthism all over again. Yes, it's not yeah, going to yeah. help. No. All the, the only reason that they people even mention the cognitive exam is because they want to keep this in the yes, press. Exactly. It's another cycle, which yeah. is why I said, if you think you can't get away with it, just get it done now. Yes. Just to cauterize it. Yeah. You know, it's um. But anyway, we've talked about enough about this. There's so many other little things we can talk about for shorter periods of time. Dave, election. Yesterday's election. Tell us all about that. Yes. Okay. So. Um, yesterday's election on Long Island was, I think, pretty important when it comes to the future of the House of Representatives. Mm. So, like, yes, it's an off-year election or, or off-cycle election, so there's a limited amount about what it can tell you. But first of all, the fact that the Democrats won, that reduced the Republican majority now functionally to they can only afford to lose two votes. That's right. That's at least until they have a couple of special elections in June. Yep. Um, so very, very important in terms of how difficult it is for Republicans to do anything in the House at the moment. That just, you know, lo- losing one more vote, that increases the degree of difficulty by an order of magnitude. Yep. Um, so this was a very, just functionally very important election. Now, the last that I saw, uh, Swazi, Tom Swazi, the Democratic candidate, had won it by eight points. Um, th- that was bigger than expected. That was significantly bigger than expected. Um, it was significantly bigger than Peter King expected. <laughs> yes. The former Republican congressman who uh, represented part of this area, uh, he told Catherine Schimalti of the Washington Post, no one saw it coming last night, said Peter King, who rep- once represented much of the district. I thought this was definitely a red wave. Now, this was never going to be <laughs> a red wave. In fact, if Republicans had actually won that seat, that would be a sign that Democrats were in terminal trouble. Mm. They're going to lose all three uh, at the next election. Can I just make the point just very yeah. quickly that this district yes. with these boundaries yes, in yeah. 2020, yes. Biden would have won by eight points. Yes. The yeah, same yeah. margin. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was traditionally a Democratic-leaning mm. district. So let's look at the ways in which Democratic victory was overdetermined here. Um, the biggest way, obviously, is the Santos factor. Mm. Now, this was weirdly downplayed by both sides throughout the election, but I cannot help but think that the first congressman to be expelled without a criminal conviction in 150 years or whatever it is, not just a national embarrassment but a global embarrassment <laughs> to the people of Long Island, I can't help but think that played some role. <laughs> In this election. So um, Swazi, by the way, had represented that district until 2022 until he uh, 
left in order to make a chaotic attempt to run for New York governor. He came a distant third in the Democratic Mm. primary. This is what paved the way for George Santos. And in this election in 2022, which overall was a disappointment for Republicans, basically except in New York, um, Santos actually won it by eight points. So really significant, um, really significant flip. And there was a lot of talk after that about how well Republicans were organised, especially in Nassau County, because it was really only their gains in New York, which included, I think, three pickups in Nassau County, along with Florida's redistricting, that actually gave them their majority, their (laughs) tiny, cursed majority. (laughs) Okay, so the Santos factor, I think, was pretty huge, Mm. Uh, even though people didn't want to talk about it for for some reason in in the election campaign. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm sure at some point last year, it must have sounded like a really good idea about, like, let's run a former member of the Israeli military as our candidate. And a registered Democrat. (laughs) Yeah. The Republican was a registered Democrat. Yeah, it it just turned out to be a bit of a dud decision. Yes. Like this is somebody who nobody knew, no mm. name recognition, yeah. no experience, no idea of how to run a campaign, and in the end very little support from the Republican Party. Yeah. Right? Massively outspent by Democrats, which is actually weird considering the significance of this seat mm. with the Republican majority mm. being what it yeah. is. I would have thought Republicans should have fought harder to defend it. As it happened, uh, you had someone who could not have had better ra- name recognition than Swazi because he had literally represented the district until two years yeah. ago, as well as having been a mayor and a, a county commissioner and all of this other stuff, like very, very well known in Long Island. Well, Dave, can I jump in here? Yeah, yeah. If that's the case. Yeah. And what I just said before I had the margins. Yes, yeah. Did the Democrats underperform? No, I don't think they underperformed. Well, it sounds like everything was going in there. No, 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 I'm going to, I'm going oh, to get okay, to okay. this. We're getting there. We're getting I'm there. going okay. to right. get to this. Okay. Oh, at sorry. the moment, I'm talking about the ways yeah. in which this was just the fact that it was a victory was overdetermined. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you have, you know, possibly the worst mismatch in terms of experience. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, b- uh, between these two candidates. Okay. So those are the two big ways in which it's overdetermined. There's also been a lot of talk about the fact there was a snowstorm. And because Democrats had a massive advantage in early voting, oh, no, no, yeah. uh, that that also could have helped. But remember, mm. we are talking about another 16-point turnaround. Mm. We're talking about mm. going from Republicans winning by eight points to Democrats winning by eight points. Sure. So even with those two factors mm. in place, mm. it shouldn't have been by as much as it was. Then we have countervailing factors going on. Right, one is the vaunted Nassau County turnout machine. Mm. Okay, after the 2022 election, Republicans across the country were looking to Nassau County as the example of how to get it done in the suburbs, how to turn um, what have been the Republicans' biggest problem, that is middle class suburbs going blue, uh, back to red again. Um, it it just didn't work. It didn't help. Um, uh, you know, they, they were massively outspent by Democrats. They clearly didn't have any kind of ground game uh, going on. They weren't doing the, you know, the shoe leather work. This wasn't a seat that they should have just given up on, mm. a seat that they'd won by eight points last time around and that is absolutely crucial to the Republican majority and that is happening in an election year and that is viewed as the first test of Republican versus Democratic approaches to immigration after Mm. the failure of the border bill. This isn't something that the Nassau County uh, vaunted turnout machine should have fucked up this badly, Mm. Mm. but they did. Um, Now, getting back to what I was talking about last week, where, you know, Democrats keep winning all of these little elections that are broadly not viewed as predictive, but when they win so many of them so consistently this does reveal a pattern of better party organisation. And it does raise serious doubts about whether the uh, sort of Trump takeover of the Republican Party, which has devoted so much energy to purging the non-Trump elements to it, has actually completely hollowed out the Republican Party when it comes to organisation, which is what might be needed in a contest between two candidates about whom people are not very enthusiastic. Mm. Um, But the second big thing that Republicans would be worried about was, of course, that this comes so soon 
after the destruction of the border bill. And this was being touted by both sides as well. Let's see how this actually plays out in this election uh, in an area where this was supposedly a really big issue. Yes. Right. So yeah. certainly this was at the centre of the Republican campaign, the claim that Swazi kicked ICE out of Long Island. Mm. Um uh, you know, Swazi, for his part, as has been widely uh, lauded, he leaned into the issue. He criticised Biden. He said that Biden should close the border. Um, and, you know, if it was an issue, it doesn't seem to have been an issue that hurt him. I, I should add to that that, yeah. that Swazi's background is he was one of the founders of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Yes, that's right. He's, he's yeah, one yeah. of those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and a massive centrist. And, yeah, and his yeah. slogan was, let's fix it. Let's fix it. So, yeah, congressional yeah, yeah. dysfunction is kind of his right. bread and butter. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. And Bob, and Bob the Builders as yes. well. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> yes. So there are three ways of... Um, looking at this. Mm. One, which I'm seeing a lot of commentary in this vein, is that Swazi succeeded basically because he ran to the right of Biden on uh, immigration yeah. and this is what Democrats are going to have to do. Uh, second take is that this is the result of, uh, you know, all the things we are talking about last week, Republicans torpedoing this bill. Now Democrats have a response. We're the ones who tried mm. to do a deal. Mm. You're the ones who uh, who refused it. Mm. And so it's not necessarily the Democrats need to run to the right of Biden. They just need to make that point. We tried. Uh, we tried to fix it. You stopped us from fixing it uh, because you thought that it would be politically inconvenient for Trump. Mm. Uh, but there's a third angle on this at the, uh, at the moment, and I realise I'm the only one pushing it, but th that's the point I also made last week, which is people don't care about... The this issue as much as they pretend to care about it, <laughs> right? Yep. That all of these people in Long Island who are 30 miles away from any immigrant who is coming <laughs> anywhere near them, as much as they claim that they see this as a terrifying invasion, when a few fucking snowflakes fall, <laughs> they're not coming out to vote against it, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, you know, given that, the entire Republican caucus just showed that they don't give a shit about this issue. Why should they expect the mm. voters to? The only person who cares about this is Chaz. It's true. It's right? true. I am literally the only person who cares about this. <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> um, those are sort of three ways of looking at that issue. But however you look at it, um, this does suggest that there might be limitations to how far Republicans can actually ride this issue. Uh, in the general election campaign. What do we think about the fact that Democrats keep on winning special elections? As I said, I think that that shows a pattern of the reversal of the Obama years where in the Obama years Democrats were a national popular vote winning machine uh, who were stagnant at every other level. Mm -hmm. um, famously during the Obama years they lost 900 legislative seats across uh Congress and uh, various state houses. Um, the the state parties were innovated. Mm. Um, they the you know local organisation was just not very strong. All of this came home to roost in 2016, where they just didn't have the campaign um, where it was needed. Uh, since then, I believe that the Democratic Party organisation at every level has become a lot stronger. It's a very, you know, that they realised they needed to take these races seriously. Apart from the presidency, they needed to take every race seriously and they do it. And, they're, you know, sure, these are, these are races where it's only high propensity voters voting, but you've still got to get them out. And Democrats are doing it and Republicans are not. And, you know, it's very hard for us to see from this distance what's actually going on on the yeah. ground. But this pattern suggests that Democrats have an organisational advantage over Republicans. Whether that's enough to overcome an advantage that Trump might have over Biden by the time the election rolls around may well not be. It may, and, you know, and you could definitely make the argument that when Trump's on the ballot, Republicans behave differently. But uh, that's what I think this says. Uh, you make a good point about us not being able to tell from, yes. from, from our, yeah, uh, yeah. over these waters. Um, let me throw a... a idea at you and see what you think about that. This is yep. from New York Times analysis from a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that special elections have special voters. Yes. And 92% uh, of special election voters mm -hmm. have voted in a recent primary mm. compared to 50% of registered voters. Yep. 50% of special election voters are 65 plus 
compared yep. to 26% yes, yeah, of registered that voters. One. Yes, yep. 12% of special election voters are registered independents mm-hmm. compared to 32% of registered voters. Yes. Uh, 23% of them are black or Hispanic compared to 29% of yep. registered voters. 4% of them are 18 to 29 compared to 15% yes. of registered voters. Yep. And Biden polled about six percentage points more mm. amongst validated special election voters in yes. post Dobbs elections and registrants overall in yep. the same districts. Absolutely, yes. Also, mm-hmm. across every demographic category in this analysis, yep. Democrats did better amongst high turnout voters of the same demographic than amongst low turnout voters yes. of the same demographic. Absolutely, yes. So, yes. for example, 96% of college-educated registered Democrats mm-hmm. who voted in special elections supported yep. Biden. Yeah. 83% of college-educated registered Democrats who didn't vote in special elections supported Biden. Yes. So, given all that. Yeah. And you already mentioned that the Trump factor. Yes, yeah, yeah. Does this mean that when we get to the general election, it might just be the direct reverse? Look, that's one possibility. Mm. Um, but those are voters that Biden can actually rely on. Mm. So Trump's made all of these gains mm. with groups that are generally considered to be low propensity voters. Mm. Now, for a long time, it was a reverse situation. The Democrats constantly had an advantage with groups of people who were less likely to vote. Mm. Right? This is you often heard the argument if voting was compulsory, Democrats would win every election. Um and, you know, so having an advantage with these groups, that can sometimes create illusions in the opinion polls, right? Um, and this is why, you know, it always used to be the case that if you put a likely screen on, the Republicans would, uh, likely voter screen on, the Republicans would uh, benefit. You don't, you don't see that so consistently anymore. Um, so one of the things that it's going to come down to is, is this election going to be another very high turnout election? like 66% as it was um, last time around, in which case any kind of advantage the Democrats have in these special elections is going to vanish. Um, Or is it going to be something significantly lower than that, in which case having this really solid, reliable block of high propensity voters might actually uh, actually come into play. Um, Yesterday's election on Long Island was not the only significant election that took place. Go on. There was also an election in the Pennsylvania State House mm. in Bucks County. Now, that's a state house. Uh, there were only about 10,000 voters total, right? So, mm. you know, there's limitations to what we can uh, read into it. Um, also, a generally pretty safe Democratic seat albeit in a county that is one of the pivotal counties of the entire country, uh, which is, yeah, Bucks County, it's it's suburban Philadelphia. Okay, so what happened in, uh, in that race? And by the way, that was another very important House race because Democrats had a 101 to 100 advantage. Uh, if they had lost that, it would have been deadlocked. Mm. The House would have been deadlocked. Um, No, but they won. Okay, Mm. so they won it by 20 points last time around. They won it by 37 points this time around. Now, once again, that kind of um, increase, it shows, you know, which party machine is a lot stronger. Mm. Um, And once again, you know, that's not... Even if if that was a long shot for Republicans, it's not a seat they should have been giving up on, given that, uh, you know, given how important it actually... Um, it actually was. Um, and, yeah, going from a 20-point advantage to a 37-point advantage, uh, whichever way you look at that, that's a healthy gain mm. um, for Democrats in a county which is one of the most pivotal counties in the entire country. Yep. Um, uh, they're picking up votes. And once again, it's a suburban county, right? So it's part of this suburban problem that Republicans are continuing to have. So... Um, like, yeah, the point is totally taken with the New York Times analysis and, like, that is why these contests aren't, uh, you know, aren't considered reliably predictive. But nonetheless, some of the things that they could be pointing to uh, could show that if it becomes a race to get unmotivated voters out, uh, you're like, yes, at the moment you're seeing Democrats with an advantage with these high propensity voters, but, you know, you're also seeing that they've got a party machine in place 
that seems to have its shit together when it counts a lot more than the Republicans do. Yeah. Um, and as I said, like it, you know, the race has got to be close for that to actually make a difference. Mm. You know, it's got to be within one or two points for it to actually make a difference. If he, if it's a three to five point difference, it won't. Um, and yes, like maybe the old Trump magic is going to work again and he won't even need the Republican Party uh, or its organisation because he'll have enough, uh, you know, just really enthusiastic uh, people. Um, but uh, this constant pattern that we're seeing isn't something that could just be written off. Fair enough. My last question about elections yes. for you is that there's something else that happened in the last couple of days which yep. might be relevant is Larry Hogan declared that he's running for the Senate in Maryland. Mm. Do you think that Larry, Larry, Larry Hogan, for those who don't know, yeah. was a was two-time governor in Maryland. He's yep. a Republican, but he's the most moderate Republican you could possibly have, mm. classic blue state Republican. Yep. Uh, he won twice quite comfortably, but in midterms. Yes. He didn't have to run in presidential yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when he's running for the Senate in a presidential year, does he have any chance of winning the seat in Maryland or is it just um, partisanship going to rule? I'd say he, he would not be the favourite. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I I mean... Could he do well enough to draw resources from from Democrats to have to try and compete against him? Ooh, good question. I mean, the thing is, I think that... I think Republicans won the Senate anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the fact it looks increasingly <laughs> likely that Carrie Lake's going to be their nominee in Arizona. Mm. Uh, she had, she apparently now has the endorsement of uh, the RNC. Yeah. They got, they got Senate seats to waste. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, I still don't, given the makeup of Maryland, I think it's a very tall order for mm. Larry Hogan. You know, given there are plenty of deep blue states that elect uh, Republican governors with a degree of regularity mm. doesn't mean that they're going to elect a Republican senator okay. in a race like this. That's elections. Stats, stats nugget. Yeah. Stats nugget. Woo! One of my trademark depressing stats nuggets, this one's, but oh, also no. a guessing competition. Okay. <laughs> Out of heroin, meth, cocaine, and fentanyl. <laughs> That's a good start. Yep. Which drug had the highest percentage of regular users dying of an overdose in 2022, Dave? Heroin, meth, cocaine, and... Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Um, well... What's the deadliest drug in terms of percentages of regular users who die of an overdose? Uh, I've got no idea. No guess? Um, I'll say heroin. Okay, it's fentanyl. Yeah. Now, if 1% of regular heroin users yeah. died of overdose in 2022, which is yeah. what they did, yep. 1% of regular heroin yes. users died of overdose in 2022, what percentage of regular fentanyl users died of overdose in 2022? Uh, 5%. 22.7% of regular fentanyl users oh, died okay. of overdose in 2022. Right, okay. That's based on a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration estimate of 330,000 regular fentanyl users in 2022. For those who are wondering, for cocaine, it was 1.5% mm. in 2022. For oh, meth, more than heroin. Yeah, more than heroin. For meth, it was- I've got such a 90s mindset when it comes to drugs. You got to get up to date, man. Yeah, I, I do. For meth, it was 2.1% who died of yeah. overdose in 2022. Just to be clear, that's 22.7% died in one year. So what Chaz is saying is if you're choosing between those four, actually choose heroin. Heroin. I am, yeah. Chaz is recommending, I am recommending if you plan to become a regular drug user and you plan to choose between those, those four drugs- You'll be better off choosing heroin. I would advise you to choose none of those drugs. But if you were going to, I certainly would recommend you, you choose. You should play the opening monologue from Train Spotting. <laughs> choose <laughs> life. I certainly would recommend you don't choose fentanyl. That much okay. is very, very clear. All right. So there's that. Okay. Uh, Dave, I, I talked so much at the beginning. Let's give again get another one of your topics. Uh, you want to talk about the Mark Stein defamation case? Yes. Okay. So. Um, like many people, I had forgotten that this defamation case was going on. I forgot Mark Stein was going on. Yeah, because it was initiated in 2012. Mm. So this was Michael Mann, climate scientist at Penn State University, who was really a favourite target for the right. Mm. And my kind of distaste about this entire thing, it goes back to the fact that there was this whole discourse on the right that climate science basically was Michael Mann. 
Mm. It was all Michael Mann. He was the hockey stick. Guy. Yeah, Michael Mann was this master propagandist, and if you di- <laughs> if you disprove that, bang, you've disproven <laughs> climate science. Right? It showed yeah. a deep misunderstanding of what science actually was, mm. a deep misunderstanding of exactly how important Michael Mann is to climate science, mm. um, uh, and also. Yeah, every right winger in the world knew who Michael Mann was because their publications were obsessed with him. Um, the average person who thinks that climate change is real has no idea who Michael Mann is, or no idea what the uh, what the hockey stick was. If there's one figure who you know convinced the world of climate science, it's probably Al Gore. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it's who not is Michael Mann, notably not a scientist. Um, but you know, <laughs> the the nature of science is that it's a massive community exercise. Mm. Um, and it's not no, it's not down to any uh, any one single person. The the sort of days of the lonely genius shifting the entire paradigm that you know the Aristotle's and Isaac Newtons and even Albert Einstein's um, that is long gone mm. uh, because of the sheer volume of uh, of scientific research that uh, that happens now. Um, but there was, yeah, there was this real kind of sense that climate science was all about Michael Mann. And I've got to say, Michael Mann bears a lot of the responsibility for this <laughs> because uh, he often did kind of give the, imp- <coughs> give the impression that it was basically all about him and these attacks on him were like potentially mortally wounding to climate science mm. itself. Okay, so um, bearing in mind that he'd been this hate figure on the right for a long time, um, in 2000 and uh, 12, I think it was, um, some blogger I'd never heard of writing for a blog that I had never heard of uh, likened... Wasn't one of my blogs. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. Uh, likened Michael Mann to Jerry Sandusky. Now, um, uh, Jerry Sandusky was uh, the defensive coordinator at Penn State University who was convicted of molesting a lot of children. Mm as part of the uh, Second Mile charity. This was the, I mean, it was a, this was a huge and deeply unpleasant scandal. Uh, it was what led to the sacking of Joe Paterno, who was one of the most famous and, to that point, loved college football coaches in America because he had apparently known what was going on, although he claimed he didn't. It's a very painful thing for the whole Penn State University community, let's put it that way. So This does sound defamatory. Yeah, yeah. So saying, <laughs> saying that he had molested the data in the same way that Jerry Sandusky had molested children, not, not only was that... Defamatory. It was kind of really nastily calculated yeah. to hurt. Yeah. Um, now, so Mark Stein. <laughs> that does remind me of 2012. Yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> yeah. No. So Mark Stein, who was a far better known figure than mm. Rand Sinberg. Mm. Uh, so Mark Stein, like as far as I can tell, he's mainly a radio figure now. And these a, days, yeah. yeah, yeah, but back then he used he to be was, a columnist. Yeah, yeah, back then he was a columnist and, a, and he was on Fox News and a blogger. Yeah, 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 and he was so he was writing for National Reviews, um, mm. the corner. Mm. It's also worth noting, like Mark Stein was huge in the two thousands. He was. He was like one of the biggest figures in right wing media. He was in Australian media all the time. Like the ABC had a weird fetish for bringing him on, mm. even before the Iraq War. Like they loved having him debating Christopher Hitchens. Uh, they, you know, because you know he's entertaining. Yeah, he was kind of a a troll of the intelligentsia. He was, yes, yeah, like yeah, totally, like yeah. yeah, like he he yeah he was he's a smart guy who can speak smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, he was always fighting unfair. Yes, and yeah, abusing yeah. people in yeah. in uh, quite distinguished language. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> was also like insanely optimistic about mm. the Iraq War, which mm. is one of the things that made him very popular here in Australia. Mm. So, he, like, and, and because of the fact that he's got this. English boarding school accent mm. and he would chuck in very breezily a lot of very educated sounding kind of uh, claims and allusions and mm. references. Mm. Uh, yeah, people got the impression that he was an authority on all kinds of things, not just the things he actually was an authority on, which is very specifically Broadway and musical theatre in general, which mm. he's very good on, mm. but on you know the Iraq War and demographics and climate science mm. and all kinds of uh, all kinds of other stuff. I remember because he loved Alexander Downer. Like he <laughs> he repeatedly referred to Alexander Downer as the world's greatest foreign minister. And he was an expert on musicals. 
Oh, what yes. What did he think of, of down as famous Ezio song, the uh, Kokomo I, takeoff? I, oh, I've got to play that for you guys if you haven't question. seen this. We'll have to. Hanoi, Vietnam, we're here at ASEAN. Often it's new to see. There's a group called ASEAN. That's where we have a yarn, but not about Taiwan. We want an FTA, but one of you said go away. Never mind, we'll cope and we'll do it bilaterally. That's the Australian way. Ooh, I want to take you to the Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, I'm pretty mama, Hanoi, Vietnam. There you go. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> um, but I remember... Like when on one of Mark Stein's many visits to Australia, uh, like Alexander Downer saying that, like, you know, he would always print out Mark Stein's columns, but oh, but sometimes he couldn't read them in bed because his wife had already grabbed them and was reading them instead. So that was kind of the level of okay. influence that, that yeah. Mark Stein would have foreign yeah. minister bed reading. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, now he had slipped a bit by 2012 yeah. because. The, the Happy Warrior stuff had gone deeply out of fashion by uh, by that point. Mm. But like many people on the right, both here and in the United States, he made this very neat pivot from insane Iraq war optimism to climate science is a complete hoax. <laughs> like it's, it's amazing the shift that took the, mm. like you, you look at the sort of the, the number of column inches that were dedicated to Iraq that from about 2008 onwards just shifted straight over to climate science is not real. Mm. Um, it was the biggest kind of distraction mm. uh, that they could come up with. So this was all part of that. Um, now, Stein, I, he, he said something in his column like, uh, I wouldn't have gone as far into the locker room as Rand Sinberg d- uh, did, but he had a point. Mm. Um, and he claimed that because, you know, Michael Mann had been accused of manipulating data. Mm. Penn State did an investigation into him, found that there was no wrongdoing there. Mm. Stein likened it to Penn State uh, clearing, I, I think, clearing Joe Paterno of any involvement in mm. the um, uh, in the Sandusky stuff, which Penn State did not. Uh, Penn State st- uh, sacked Joe Paterno. I can't quite remember what the analogy <laughs> okay. was, whether I've gone wrong or whether Mark Stein did. But anyway, Mark Stein was saying he didn't directly liken Michael Mann to Jerry Sandusky. Okay. Anyway, so this is 2012. 2012, this defo case was initiated. I don't know why. And, and Stein called him a fraud. Yeah, yeah. Stein That's called him a fraud. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fraud. That was, yeah, yes. called the master of the tree ring circus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is why I don't know why it took so long. I do remember back in 2012 that Stein was bragging about it. He's mm. like, okay, well. The, yeah, bring it on. Let's go to court. I will use this courtroom to show that climate science is a hoax. Mm. Okay, so like most people, I then promptly forgot about it until the, the verdict was actually had a de- I was mm. like, oh, holy shit, this trial actually happened. Yeah. And reading about it, like a lot of people, I was very surprised by the outcome. Okay, so the outcome was um, Michael Mann won against both Rand Sinberg, won damages from both Rand Sinberg and Mark Stein. He got... Uh, Compensatory damages from them of $1 each. That's right. But he got punitive damages from Rand Sinberg of $1,000 and punitive damages from Mark Stein of a $1 million. At that point in time, I need to explain to people yes. what that means is the court found yeah. that Michael Mann had suffered $2 worth of damage. $2 worth of reputational damage. But he, they wanted to punish Mark yes. Stein to the tune of $1 million. That's right. Yes. So the... The idea that man had suffered reputational damage, you know, was on its face not very plausible. Mm. Like, you know, he was cleared of any kind of misconduct by uh, Penn State as the, um, you know, as, as the defendants accurately pointed out, it probably raised his profile. Um, the things that he was <coughs> talking about where he felt ostracised, people gave him dirty looks at the grocery store, and he claimed that he missed out on grant money, even though he clearly got quite a bit of grant money. <laughs> yes. uh, but also he um, didn't produce any witnesses around mm. the uh, reputational stuff. It's almost amazing that he actually got $2 out of that. <laughs> yes. Okay, so 
But there were punitive damages, okay? Mm-hmm. And the punitive damages were that Stein and Sinberg had actually met the extremely high American bar for defamation, which is not just that you say something that is false and damaging to someone, but you know that it's false and damaging, to, and you recklessly disregard the falsity of it. That is a very, very difficult thing. Yeah, to malice. Prove. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, very difficult thing to prove, um, particularly difficult in the case of someone like Mark Stein, who just has a really long record of insisting that he doesn't think that climate change is real. Mm. And it's, uh, you know, you can easily imagine that he believed what he was uh, what he was saying. I don't know how he lost. About, about Michael Mann. Well, yeah, Michael well, Mann's a public figure, which yeah, means yeah, yeah. It's, it's as high a stand as you can he, have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, so, like, I say this as someone who thinks that what Stein said was stupid and mm. wrong and scientifically illiterate. Yeah. Um and, and and you know and was designed to to try to damage the the case of the scientific case of climate change. All of that um I was still really surprised at the outcome until <laughs> until please explain this to me. I saw the only fact about this case that actually matters which is Stein represented himself oh, in court. Okay. All right. Kids, do not <laughs> represent yourself in court. If you are going to court, get a lawyer because it is a different environment mm. from anything else. And now, a real lawyer, not Alina Harbour. <laughs> Even Alina Harbour could have won this. <laughs> yes. Now, I don't know why Stein chose to represent himself. Um, was it because he brought the same breezy overconfidence that he brought to the <laughs> Iraq war? <laughs> to this case, I don't know. Was it because he couldn't afford a lawyer? Maybe he practised shock and awe, <sighs> like know. the Iraq War. Like I would have thought that they could have passed around the hat on the National Review cruise or something to pay <laughs> for a lawyer. He could afford a lawyer. He really could afford a lawyer. But, okay, here's the thing, right? Being a juror is hard. Mm. You know, it's, it's really hard. This is one of the reasons why people try to... Avoid it. You're thrust into these high-stakes court situations. You have to make sense of these really complicated uh, cases when you yourself have no experience or or background uh, in any of it. Um, You have to concentrate for a very long time on things that are very hard. And you are instructed as a juror, you know, concentrate on the facts um, of of the case. Now, imagine that. Like, you're in this environment, you're trying to concentrate on the facts of the case, and all of a sudden in comes DJ Cornball (laughs) doing his 50s nightclub warm-up comedian act (laughs) to the jury. You're going to be like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) Like, uh, because, you know, National Review was quoting some of the things that Stein was saying to the jury, mm. which they found particularly convincing. That yeah. you know, Stein went on this whole uh, spiel about, oh, did he really get a, a dirty look at the grocery store because I'd written something bad about him, or because he, you know, he cut the guy off in the parking lot, or because he oh. talked to last avocado? Like, um, okay, that that works well in a column. Yeah, that well, sounds exactly kind of. like the sort of thing that Mark Stein wrote. In a collar. If you're a juror struggling to make sense of all this, someone coming out and making all of these, the defendant, no less, <laughs> coming out and making all of these rapid fire jokes, like even if they're, you know, he was actually, he, he was making a serious point. If, I'll, mm. I'll go so far as to say the point he was making there was probably correct. Yeah. But that is not how you make an argument in a courtroom. Mm. People have expectations of how people are supposed to conduct themselves uh, in courtrooms. Um, and, yeah, it, it's not as you would expect to read in a blog. This is E.J. Carroll all over again. It is. Like Trump, it's absolutely E.J. Carroll all Trump over again. Trump and Mark Stein both thought yeah. they knew best and yes. they made the jury hate them and oh. then they paid for it with punitive damages. That's right. That is absolutely right. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, I'm sure this will be appealed. There's a good chance that, you know, some some judge will probably reduce the... This time he'll get a lawyer, I think. I, I hope. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, and then they'll reduce but the But, like, the you know, his defense is like, this is a really sad day for the First Amendment. Like, Well, if it is, it's Stein's fault. Yep. Right? And it's a lesson for everyone, which is get a lawyer if you're going to court. 
the lawyers know how to make legal arguments. <laughs> yeah. The lawyers know how to present facts in yeah. ways that juries will actually understand and yeah. appreciate. Yeah. They <laughs> behave in ways that judges and juries and the public in general expects you to deport yourself uh, in a courtroom. Get a lawyer. This is good advice from yes. Dr. Dave Smith. That's right. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. No. I, I'm not I'm not saying this because I'm trying to drop no. business. No, there's no conflict of interest. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I'm saying this as a non-lawyer because I know if I ever end up in court, I'm getting a lawyer. And after this podcast, we might both end up in court. <laughs> and <we'll, laughs> I'll get a lawyer too, even though I'm a qualified lawyer. Well, not quite a lawyer. I've got a law degree. Um, mm. On that, uh, you've been doing so well with the guessing games. I've, 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 okay. got, I've got a quick one for you. Start yeah, start. Nuggets. Uh, apart from the drug overdose. Guessing game. Oh, yeah, okay. You didn't I, quite, I actually got the. You struck that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a big way. But that's okay. That's right. If, if you're going to strike out on something, that's a good thing to strike out on. Yes. I don't want you to be an expert on drugs. No. <laughs> okay, there's a few guesses here. I'm going to try and roll through this pretty quick. Yeah. A few ones. This is from the Census Bureau's current population survey, 2023. Just came out. Yep. Lots of interesting stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, what are the occupations? I'm going to run through all the demographics. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. What are the occupation? I've got the top five here. Yep. The occupations that have the highest percentage of African Americans filling them. So, okay. so the job is so, so whatever job it is. Yeah, yeah. It has a higher percentage of African Americans in that job than any other job. Okay. Yeah. What was it? What's your guess? No idea. <laughs> okay. Well, you didn't pass that guessing yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, African Americans are 13% of the workforce, 48% mm -hmm. of all mail sorters, yeah. processors, and processing, processing machine operators are African American. Okay. The next four are the nursing assistant, mm -hmm. security guard, postal service clerk, and probation officer. Let's keep on rolling. Highest percentage of Latino Americans filling the job? Um,. No, don't know. There is one racial stereotype in this, <laughs> but uh, it's not the main one. The main one is drywall or ceiling tiles ah. installers. 74% of drywall or ceiling tile installers are Latinos. Okay. The next four are yep. roofers, mm -hmm. carpet, floor, or tile installers yep. or finishers. Painters, okay, yes. housekeepers. Yeah, yeah, That's yep. the cliche. Very big in the construction industry. Yep. By the way, wet. <laughs> The years 2008 to 2016, this question was really easy to answer because you said, which occupation has the highest percentage of African Americans? You could say, President of the United States. That's true. 100%. That is true. Oh, shit, yeah. It's, oh, I've, I've, yeah, you're right. Can't White people's that. coming up. Okay. We'll, we'll, disclude, we'll, we, we <laughs> we'll exclude, we'll President exclude President of the United States. That's right. I agree, yeah. Uh, we're up to Asian Americans. Uh, the highest percentage of Asian Americans filling them. No, that's okay. 7% uh, of the workforce are Asian Americans. 65% of manicurists or pedicurists are oh, Asian okay. American. And uh, the next four are medical scientists, software developers, non-medical scientists, and computer hardware engineers. Okay. And for those, I've been reading out the pay of all these jobs, but mm -hmm. until now, every single one of them has been quite low paid. Right, yes. The uh, the main one, the, the manicurist, pedicurist, wasn't high paid, but mm -hmm. the next four, they were very high paid. Okay. Uh, let's get to white Americans, Caucasians. What do you reckon? Fox News presenter. 96% <laughs> of agricultural managers are Caucasian. Okay. They're farmers. Right. <laughs> and next four are cost est estimators, miscellaneous construction and related workers, surveying and mapping technicians, and property appraisers and assessors. Okay. There we go. Men, most male that dominate jobs. What do you reckon? Um, I think I've actually heard this one and I've forgotten it. Construction equipment operator is number one. Okay. 98%. percent mm hmm Oh, 99%. Yeah. And the 98% are pipe layers, brick masons, block masons and stone masons, bus and truck mechanics mm -hmm. and logging workers. Loggers. Okay. And the five most female dominated jobs. 
99% of skincare specialists are mm. females. And the other four are over 94%. They are preschool or kindergarten teachers. Ah, uh, yes. Legal secretaries and administrative assistants, mm-hmm. dental hygienists, hygienists, and speech language pathologists. Okay. There we go. There How we about go. that? Now it's time for what I haven't been what I haven't been doing, doing for the last three weeks, which is the LNG thing. Oh. Woo! Okay, now, Biden has a mixed record. This isn't going to take too long, don't worry. Okay. Biden has a, has a mixed record on climate change. Yes, he does. We, we do know that. The yes. Inflation Reduction Act is the largest investment in fighting climate change ever. Yep. Uh, he launched the American Climate Corps. Yep. That he set a new national goal to reduce emissions, mm-hmm. uh, which was 50 to 52% reduction by, from 2005 levels by yep. 2030. He's begun the process of phasing down super pollutant H- HFCs and methane emissions. Mm. He's also overseen the biggest oil and gas producing year in US history, which was this year. Yes. By an absolute mile. Every time they, the Republicans talk about drill, baby, drill, yep. Biden is drilling, baby, <laughs> drill. Let me assure you. Um, he greenlit a bunch of big gas projects that have annoyed environmental groups hugely. Yes. And last week, he did the square up. Oh, now it's last fortnight. Yep. He did the square up. What's the policy? He's paused the approval process yep. for new LNG exports, that's liquid natural gas, Yes. for countries which don't have free trade agreements with the US. Right. Okay, so under Section 3 of the Natural Gas Act of 938, the Department of Energy has to determine whether infrastructure is, quote, consistent with the public interest. Yes for exports to countries that the US doesn't have a free tra- trade agreement with. That's yes. the law. Yep. Once the infrastructure is approved, that's it. It's mm. built, it's there for decades. You're not yep. getting rid of it, okay? So you get a long-term license when you're, once you're granted it. There are no reviews. Mm. So the current way that they determine whether it's consistent with the public interest yes. is by using these figures from a group called NERA, which, uh, which stands for the National Economic Research Associates. Yep. Uh, they last determined those those figures back in 2018 yep. during the Trump administration. Yes. And uh, I've got no idea who NERA are, but environmentalists hate them. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Trump they u- do sound dodgy. <laughs> yes. Trump used NERA figures to justify yep. withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, for example. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's those guys. Yeah. And the White House doesn't like them much either. They yeah. say the current economic and environmental analyses are roughly five years old and no longer adequately account for considerations like potential energy cost increases mm-hmm. for American consumers and manufacturers beyond current authorizations or the latest assessment of the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. Right. Obviously, it's the impact of greenhouse gas emissions they're worried about. Yes. Okay, so they've gone for an update in the way they perform the calculation. There are potentially 16 new gas export terminals that are yet to be built that could be delayed or aborted because of this decision. Mm. They're waiting uh, permission. What's the knock on this decision? Well, America doesn't have a free trade agreement with Europe, essentially, so it affects them. Mm. And the knock on this is that Europe's been struggling for gas ever since the Ukraine war, Mm -hmm. and they need America's gas, and denying it will not stop them using gas. It will send them to Russia. Yeah. That's the knock, and Qatar. Yes. Uh, and it won't reduce the amount of worldwide gas usage because Europe will still be using gas. It will just deprive America of an export and give Russia a freebie. That's the knock. That's mm. what they say, right? It could also help Australia, by the way. We're, yes. we're number two in the world behind America. Yeah. They also make the point that if Europe doesn't get gas in the short term, they're not going to erect a bunch of solar panels overnight. They'll no. just start burning coal. Yes. And, the, and so and the LNG is obviously better than coal. Although, importantly... LNG is less environmentally friendly than normal gas. Mm. That's important. Normal gas is quite efficient. Yes. If you don't have leaks. Yep. Uh, you just take it out of the ground, you pump it into a house, right? Yep. That's much more efficient than freezing it to minus 160 degrees so it's mm. liquefied. Yep. And then making it much smaller in volume and more transportable and pumping it into a tanker and then sailing that tanker across the world yes. and then uh, taking it off the tanker. Past and then Yemen some, and Somaliland <laughs> exactly. and all those places. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So the benefits of gas are greatly reduced with yes. LNG. Yep. Okay. Uh, my favourite personal critique is I hear a lot yep. is the concern for Europe. You can see how much the plight of Europe has really, really upset some independent philanthropists. <laughs> like the CEO of the American Petroleum Institute. 
<laughs> he said, this is nothing more than a broken promise to our allies. Oh. Uh, National Review said, even though the administration per, uh, administration's permit pause will not have any short-term effect on the amount of American LNG that goes to Europe, it risks damaging the credibility of the US as an ally at a critical time. Can't you feel the credibility ebbing away, Dave? Credibility. <laughs> uh, it might not actually make any difference to the environment at all, if we're being honest, mm. because it doesn't affect current exports nope. or projects that have already been approved that have been built. Yeah, yeah. The US currently has seven functioning LNG export terminals. They're all huge. Yes. Five more are already under construction. Yes. And they're going to be busy. Not only will the US remain the world's largest gas exporter after this decision, yep. but according to the White House, they will double their exports by 2028. <laughs> Even with this decision. So I think yeah. Europe will be okay. I think that Europe <laughs> will remain warm. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, producing this new methodology might only take a few months. Yes. They didn't say how long it's going to take. Yes. Uh, and then all the approvals might happen anyway. Yes. Uh, or it might delay them permanently. We don't know. Yes. Uh, if it does take a while... Also, they've said they'll end the pause immediately if there's a national security emergency of some sort. Yeah. For any country. Yes. So, Wait, given yeah. the number of things that can be construed as national security emergencies. Yes. yes. And by the way, this might have a bonus effect on America about costs because if you reduce the exports, mm. they're still pumping out the same amount of gas. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, it might drive prices down in America. Good. Yes. Yeah. That, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so that is ironic. It might make gas more popular <laughs> internally. There you go. Uh, anyway, okay, so what's the politics of it? It's clearly a sop for young people yep. before the election. That's, yes. <laughs> let's not deny this. No. Uh, the announcement was made all about climate change. They weren't talking about domestic prices. They were talking no. about climate change. Yep. Uh, in 2020, views on climate change was one of the strongest predictors of how people voted, especially yeah. amongst independents. Uh, more than a quarter of Republicans in 2020 who think, oh no, this is generally, more than a quarter of Republicans who think climate change is very important. Oh, this was 2020. Voted, yeah. Bi voted for Biden in 2020. Yeah. Ipsos in November found Democrats have a 26 point lead over Republicans on the issue of climate change. Mm -hmm. And there are not many issues you can say that no. for, Dave. <laughs> On the other hand, both Democrat Pennsylvania senators, Federman and Bob Casey, are dead against it. I yeah. think they're worried about the credibility of our alliances, Dave. <laughs> Nothing to do with fracking in Pennsylvania at all. Uh, and Pennsylvania is one of the probably three critical states for the election. Totally, yes. So there is a, there is a potential election losing factor there. Yeah, there really yeah, is, yes. It is, uh, so anyway, bottom line, to me this seems like a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Update your export approval yep. model process. Seems, yes. seems sensible. Yep. Uh, it doesn't necessarily cost anything. It yes. won't necessarily achieve anything. Yes, yeah. Everyone is over the top on this issue. <laughs> uh, the next steps are what's important. Yes. Let's see what happens next, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biden's selling it as some environmental victory. Yeah. That's what you do in an election year, but yes, yeah, it's yeah. kind of spin. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and I don't think it's going to do much for his political purposes, but it's still decent policy in my view. So that's yes. my take. Do you have anything to say about this? I think we need a T-shirt. That is in the style of the classic Uncle Sam wants you. Yes. So like, Chaz wants you to update your export <laughs> approval process. I do. I really do. Yes. I'll, I will live up to that T-shirt. Good policy. Okay, Dave, last topic and then I think we're out of here. Okay. Can we mm -hmm. uh, foreshadow what might happen with a potential discharge petition? This is the topic. Okay. Condra Congress aid package. Okay. Right. <laughs> yes. Go for it. Yes. Okay. okay so so uh, after the um, aid package to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan that had the border stuff attached to it got torpedoed, um, the Senate, I think, quite surprisingly, then went ahead and negotiated a package that was very similar but didn't have any border stuff attached yep. to it. And the surprising element of it was that, uh, in the end, it was 22 Republicans voted yes, uh, voted yes, yes. Um, on it. So there were enough Republicans who, even despite the obvious pressure uh, that – uh, to, to vote against it, still voted for it. They held together very well. Mm. Now, it has been widely observed this would have a majority in the House as well. 
Mm. Um, sure, not a Republican majority, but it would have most Democrats and it would have enough Republicans to get through. Yes. The question is, could it ever get onto the floor? Mm. Well, not if Mike Johnson has anything to do with it. Yeah. Uh, Mike Johnson has declared that the House will not vote on this, not on his watch, uh, damn it, Um it needs to be a package that has border provisions. And to be fair, yeah. he can't afford for that not to be the case. No. Marjorie Taylor Greene has openly said yes. she will get rid of him. And, exactly. And the margin's that small that she can. Yeah, exactly, yes. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. if so, he if he if he gets yeah, yeah. if he so, does Ukraine funding without so immigration. He's, he's got no choice. And so he just has to sit there and take it as mm. everybody points out. Mm. Well, you're the reason why. The last thing that actually had border um Border restrictions attached to it didn't even make it to the House. Let me read Chris Murphy's quote because it's quite funny. Yep. The Speaker said he wouldn't pass Ukraine funding without a border deal and we got a border deal and then he killed the border deal because he said we didn't need a deal and now he says he won't pass our Ukraine funding bill because it doesn't include a border deal. Honestly, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that, Chris. Um, Anyway, so the one way that it could get onto the floor is what's known as a discharge petition. Mm. So this can happen with a piece of legislation that has been allowed to sit there for 30 days. That's yep. 30 sitting days. Yep. So I'm not sure when that would take us to, but this is a while down the track. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you why. Okay. There's already one. Oh, okay, right, right. Go, go on. Yes, okay. <laughs> Discharge petition means you have to get a majority of a majority vote of the house to put it on the petition. Okay, so that's going to that is going to need some Republicans on there. Mm. And you might think, well, there would be Republican support for this. Um, you know, given some of the chaos we've seen in the last few weeks, the the failed first impeachment on the etc., couldn't they get um, three petitions? But this is where it gets complicated mm. because. There will be Democrats who wouldn't sign on to this yep. um, because of the fact that it includes significant funding for Israel as mm-hmm. well. And there will be Democrats in the House who will not sign on to it for that reason. Now, so this is what makes it difficult, even though I'm sure that there would be a majority there. Um, Sorry, before you go on, let me just jump in just to yep. fill that out. Like I said, there is a – like you were about to say, there's a very complicated process. Yes, As yeah, it yeah. turns out, they went through this complicated process last year oh, for the debt deal. Ah, okay. And so there's a ripe petition just sitting there oh, that they can okay. use. Right, 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 right. right. The problem is yep. it's, it's five signatures short. Okay. Now, all the Democrats have signed that petition. Yeah, yeah. None of the Republicans have. Yes, yeah. Right? So some Democrats who would vote against this bill have already signed it. Yeah, Too yeah. late. Your signature's there. <laughs> So they can get if they can get five Republicans right. to sign on, then yes. they can have their discharge. But then you, that only then gives you a vote. Yes, yes. So there's no point doing that unless no. you have a majority for the actual vote. Unless yes. you're an idiot like the Republicans were last week. Yes, that's <laughs> like, right. yes, like you want to have the numbers, right? Yes. So it, so it does matter that the Democrats won't support it. Absolutely, even yes. though their signatures are on the discharge petition. Absolutely, right now. Okay, yes. So yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is where it's, uh, to use the notorious phrase, time for some game theory. (laughs) Um, No Republicans have said that they would sign on to the discharge petition, Mm. even the ones who you might expect Mm. would indicate. So Don Bacon from Nebraska, who's about as moderate as it gets, says, no, I'd work with the Speaker first. Now, there might be people who would be willing to sign on to it if they knew that it would actually win. Mm. But at the moment, they just don't. No, they don't. Because they don't know what the uh, – they don't know how many Democrats are going to vote for it or how many Republicans are mm. Mm. going to vote for it. Um, so that's going to make this very fraught. I think there's a possibility it actually could happen, but I it, it's definitely unlikely um, at the moment. The circumstances are weighing against it. Um, given the, like the just the atmosphere in the house at the moment, um, th- you know, if, just to go back to last week. So Mike Gallagher's already now announced that he's not running for re-election. Yes. Uh, so he was one of the three who voted against impeachment for Mayorkas on entirely reasonable and principled grounds, and entirely consistent with his previous votes against the impeachment of Trump. Um, immediately. He gets a primary threat from some Yahoo probably wearing his underpants on his head (laughs) in Wisconsin and immediately he knows he's actually going to lose to this idiot so Mm -hmm. he uh, opts not to uh, actually run again. He says, fuck it, I've had enough of this. Mm -hmm. Um, So what it would take 
for a discharge petition would have to be there would have to be some unusually clear revelation of how people would definitely actually vote. Just just to be clear as well, yeah. Any Republican who signs on to this, yeah, is essentially to vote of no confidence in Mike Johnson. It is. Yes. So and Mike Johnson's still relatively popular yeah. amongst Republicans. Even if there are big doubts beginning to yeah. develop. Yeah. But but, but, uh, but yeah. this they're basically signing their death warrant. Yes. Any Republican who signs onto this. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you're looking at people who are retiring for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And there are more than three of them or five. Yes. There, there yeah, are yeah, five yeah. or more of them. But you need an extra one for every Democrat who's not going to support them. Yeah, yeah. And how many is that? 10, 15? We don't know. Yeah. 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 So uh, my feeling is that the as, as much as there are Repub- – like if this was – you know, if this just came onto the floor for a vote, it would pass. My feeling is that Republicans do not have the incentive to, uh, to sign on to a discharge petition. I agree. And yes. the other thing I would add to this is that Mike Johnson has asked to meet up with Joe Biden to work out a deal with him yes. one-on-one. And Joe Biden has already said no. Yeah. Yeah. I think that he should have done that. <laughs> I think that was a good idea because Mike Johnson, like I said, he just needs a fig leaf. Mm. If he doesn't have a fig leaf, he's gone. Yeah. But if he can give if he can give him a fig leaf, if he can make any concession, and you know, we just saw Biden happy to make a bunch of concessions mm. last week about immigration. Yeah. If he could just make one concession, that might get Johnson that might give Johnson the excuse he needs. But yeah, you know, we'll never know because he said no. So anyway, so there's that. Uh the only thing I think I'd say about this topic yeah. is I'm back to the Senate for a second yes. when that vote was. Um, I think there is a – I saw some compelling, compelling analysis about this, mm. which is about the fact that 22 Republicans voted yes and 26 Republicans voted no. Yeah. Uh, you might think that the people who voted yes for this foreign aid bill are the hawks, the mm. guys who like the wars, right? The Israel yeah, yeah, wars, yeah. the Ukraine wars. It wasn't. No. Because Lindsey Graham, yep. Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio, they all voted no. Yes. Tom Co- to- Do you realise how much Tom Cotton craves blowing things up? <laughs> That's extraordinary. He voted no, right? Yeah. Uh, Lindsey Graham hilariously said he voted no because he wanted to be in the form of a loan rather than a grant. <laughs> and what I'm referring to there is that Trump the day before posted this. My God. From this point forward, are you listening, US Senate? No money in the form of foreign aid should be given to any current any country unless it's done as a loan. So Lindsey Graham just buckled immediately, just pathetic. Anyway, what's the divide? What is the divide? I'll tell you the divide. Yep. The average age of yes votes was 69. The average age of no votes was 58. Ah. Republicans over 65 voted 16 to 8 yes. Mm. Republicans under 65 voted 18 to 6 no. Wow. All three over 80 voted yes. All six under 50 voted no. This vote was not about foreign aid. It was Mitch McConnell versus the future. Yeah. That's what it was. The, the, I'm telling you, there is a serious power battle going on in the Senate. I say yeah. this every week. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, the younger guys know they can't cross whoever is coming after Mitch. Yep. And note the numbers are 22 to 26 against Mitch. Yes. He's pretty much a lame duck at this point in the mm. Senate. So, so that's all I have to say about this particular lame topic. Turtle. <laughs> it's a lame turtle. Do you, do you have anything to say about the Mayorkas impeachment? Uh, They're going, going by one vote. Yeah, not really. I mean, all I would say about that is the the moment for that was last week. When, yes. <laughs> you know, to, to, we're going to torpedo this weak bill mm. and instead show we're doing our jobs by mm. impeaching the Secretary of yeah. Homeland Security. That didn't happen. Instead, no, didn't. the biggest embarrassment of Mike Johnson's career happened. Instead, this happens and then a couple of hours later we get the result from New York that essentially suggests that this is not a winning issue for mm. Republicans. By the way, um, French Hill, whose name I know you love, yes. um, <laughs> was, uh, was on uh, Fox and he, like we were talking last week about how pointless this yeah, yeah. impeachment was. He, he didn't even pretend it wasn't impeachment. Yeah, I, yeah. It wasn't pointless. I mean, yeah. Have a listen to this. What more do we need to say that we need to shut the border and we know the steps to done it? We've passed them in H.R. 2. The president could take executive action to do it today. It doesn't need more money. It needs action. Uh, and this is what's disappointing to people. And that's why Mayorkas is going to pay this public relations price by being uh, impeached uh, for the first time since 1876. He explicitly says. Yes, yeah. That it's a PR it's move. It's a public relations to, price. To punish him for Biden's policies. Yes, yeah. I, <laughs> how transparent yeah. is that? 
Yeah. It's extraordinary. Just uh, I like. Uh, yeah. As I said, this this might have had a little bit more symbolic form if they hadn't fucked it up so hilariously the first time around. <laughs> okay. Look. Uh, do you want to say anything about the Super Bowl before we go? I know you wanted to say talk about the Super Bowl. Was there anything else you want to say quickly? Um. Look. For the first three hours, it was not exactly a great ad for the sport <laughs> of American football. Um. <laughs> but it was. I think it was the performance that cemented Patrick Mahomes as the best quarterback that I have uh, ever seen for the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I feel a bit limited in what I can say about that because there's just been a shooting at the a oh. mass, mass shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs celebration. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. At least one person dead, 22 injured, three people taken into custody. Okay. Uh, which kind of puts a little bit of a dampener on yeah. the whole. Uh, the whole party. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, so maybe we'll talk more about that next week when we know more about what has happened in this shooting. Okay. All right, well, let's put that on the, on the notice board. Yep. And I was going to mention something about uh, Taylor Swift, but I'll save that for that. Save that for that, that, yes. The only thing left I have to say is there's a correspondence about a month old that I lost somehow, put in my notes, oh, and okay. I didn't notice yep. it. But I'll just bring up, you asked about the Winston Churchill onesie. Yes, yeah. And... The Peppers delivered, and I okay. forgot I forgot to bring it up. Oh, fantastic. Andrew Ingans wrote, uh, Churchill's onesie was called the Siren Suit. The Siren Suit, that's what it was called. And yes. it was adapted for the public who used it when rushing to air raid shelters, so yes. they stayed warm and weren't caught in their undies. Yeah. And Marianne Powell's uh, actually sent a picture of the Siren Suit. Here we go. There we oh, go. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember seeing right that. There. Classic, beautiful, green. <laughs> yeah. It looks, it looks really soft. It's like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like velour. Yes. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's less 1940s, more 1970s, I reckon. Good, Just, good um, stuff. Head of his on time. On top of all of his other accomplishments, also the inventor of the onesie. Also a or fashionista. Not, not, yeah, yeah. Not the inventor of it, but, you <laughs> no, know, the first person. The popularizer to, of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh, that's a great note to go out on. That is. Uh, as always, keep calm and carry on in your <laughs> siren suit. <laughs> and while you're doing it, stay peppy. <laughs> <laughs>